Next, a hearing on congressional pensions held earlier today by a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee. This was the second hearing held by the Civil Service Subcommittee looking at the federal retirement system. Currently, the federal government pays over 70% of the cost of the retirement systems for its employees. The subcommittee hears testimony from representatives of the federal employee associations, unions, and retiree groups. This hearing runs three hours and 20 minutes. Can somebody get Mr. Goodlatte? If we could uh, have your attention, please. Uh, I would like to uh, begin the uh, meeting this morning of, and call to order the Subcommittee on Civil Service. Uh, this morning we have a hearing on the federal retirement system, a continuation of uh, hearings from earlier this week. And uh, I would like to uh, open the uh, hearing this morning with a, uh, I would like to open the hearing this morning with uh, some remarks. Uh, this past week, our subcommittee has focused on the question of possible changes in our federal ser civil service uh, retirement system. With an unfunded liability in excess of half a trillion dollars in the former civil service retirement system and a billion and a half dollar monthly subsidy from the general treasury, it's critical that we examine the impact and benefits of all participants in the federal retirement system. Yesterday, in an effort to address these problems, I introduced a bill which will stem some of the drain on our national treasury. The bill calls for more cost sharing by federal employees for the retirement benefits uh, which they receive. This is the first such adjustment in 26 years. Members of Congress and their staffs are also included in this reform. It may be necessary to consider additional changes in congressional pension benefits, but I will defer further considerations until after today's hearing. Today, we continue our inquiry into the terms relating to federal employment and benefits. Members of Congress are federal employees, even if you consider them only 24-month temporary contract civil servants. Uh, members of Congress and their retirement benefits must be subject to the same scrutiny, standard, and review that we have already applied to the civil service. That is why I've called this a uh, hearing today. As one of my colleagues from the other side of the aisle recently questioned me, I can't understand why Republicans rein in fire on their own troops. I responded by saying we cannot exempt members of Congress when we ask federal employees and all Americans to consider sacrifices to bring our nation's fiscal house in, into order. Today we'll hear from several members of Congress who have diverse opinions relating to changes in members' retirement benefits. Some are proposing to abolish all benefits. Some will present alternative options. As chairman of this subcommittee, I believe members of Congress deserve the same standard and measure of consideration extended to all civil servants. That means fairness and equity and their chance to be heard. So this morning I welcome our participants, my colleagues as well as experts uh, from both the public and private sector. Uh, with those comments, I would like to uh, now yield to the chairman of our full uh, committee, the uh, distinguished gentleman from and Chairman Mr. Klinger from Pennsylvania. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to start out by thanking uh, you for holding these hearings and for playing a very significant uh, leadership role in dealing with uh, what we all know are very tough issues uh, uh, in your subcommittee. Addressing the issue of federal retirement reform is never, never easy, which is probably the reason it is so rarely touched or considered. Uh, yet our current retirement system is not without fault and certainly not without flaws. This committee has the opportunity uh, in this Congress to make the current retirement systems more fiscally responsible and better able to provide the benefits that employees have worked for. Clearly, the soundness of the system has to be maintained. The legislation introduced by you, Mr. Chairman, yesterday, I believe, moves us forward in that direction. The focus of your proposal is on preserving the benefits employees have earned 
but chooses to have them share more of the government's burden in paying for those benefits. The federal pension system is a generous one. Currently, on average, federal employees recoup their share of retirement contributions in the first 22 monthly annuity checks. In other words, employee contributions are about 8 to 10 percent of their total lifetime benefits. With my full support, uh, Mr. Micah's bill recognizes and addresses the issue of equity. It takes the same actions with regard to the pensions of congressional members and staff that it takes with the pensions of federal workers in the executive branch, and it raises the executive branch employee contribution rate. It brings rates of uh, members and staff to the same level. Similarly, as the replacement rates for executive employees go from high three to high five, the same will apply to members and staff. Today, we're going to be hearing testimony that will help round out our understanding of pension systems, in particular, since the committee is considering reforms to the congressional pension system, the first part of today's hearings will focus on testimony regarding members' pensions. One proposal that I think is worth considering would establish a blended system that moves toward equalizing members' and staff retirement benefits with those of executive branch employees. But in order to move on any one proposal, we need to consider the views on all the ideas that are out there, and which is why we delighted to have uh, the sponsors of, of uh, some uh, uh, proposals with us uh, this morning. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from these members and others who have sponsored legislation in this area, as well as from members who have supporting or additional statements to offer uh, to the subcommittee. And I want to thank you all for coming today to share your thoughts and ideas, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of this panel and the subsequent panels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, the gentleman, and uh, I would like to now yield for an opening statement the uh, distinguished general uh, lady who is the ranking uh, uh, individual on our full committee, Mrs. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At Tuesday's hearing, I said I was opposed to making any changes in federal retirement programs before the House has voted on the budget resolution. My position has not changed at all in the last three days. Changes to federal retirement programs should only be made as a part of the normal budget process. And without a budget resolution, we cannot be sure that cuts are being made fairly. Everything has to be on the table, including defense and farm subsidies, not just social programs or pensions. We also need a budget resolution to be certain that savings from the retirement program will actually be used for deficit reduction. It's pretty clear that the cuts proposed by the majority, in my view, are not intended to reduce the deficit, but instead to pay for a capital gains tax cut for the wealthy. Capital gains and other tax cuts in the contract with America are estimated to cost the federal government $200 billion over the next five years. What the contract did not tell anyone is that these tax cuts would be financed by raising taxes on middle-income federal employees. Yet that is exactly what the majority of members of this committee are proposing to do at next week's markup. Bottom line, the majority wants to impose on federal employees a new 2.5% payroll tax that will not apply to anyone else. Estimates are that this new tax will cost federal employees more than $10 billion over the next five years. Now I want to make it absolutely clear that I am totally opposed to taxing federal employees in order to give a capital gains uh, break to the wealthy. I am also virtually certain that most voters do not know that the majority party's idea of tax equity is to have the middle income pay for tax cuts for the rich. Now the federal government has a contract with its employees that should be every bit as binding as the contract with America. Under this contract, however, we have asked government employees, including congressional employees who work long, hard hours, to contribute a large percentage of their salary in order to receive specified retirement benefits. Congress dealt with reforms needed in the federal retirement system in 1986. And at that time, we asked federal employees to make a final and irrevocable choice as to the retirement plan in which they would be participating. Having made that choice, federal and congressional employees have the right to expect that the government they have served well would not change the system once they agreed to participate. It should be remembered also that the federal government, by law, holds private employers responsible for meeting pension obligations to their employees. If there is an unfunded 
liability on the private plan, the employer, not the employee, is responsible for making up the deficiency. Furthermore, the federal government backs up the agency which guarantees major private pension plans in the event of an unfunded liability. Why, therefore, should the federal government be the ultimate underwriter of every major private pension plan in the country other than the one it maintains for its own employees? Federal employees have fulfilled their obligations under the federal retirement programs. It's now up to us to make sure that the government delivers on its commitments. I would point out that the only certainty most congressional employees have is that if they do somehow work long enough in the Congress, they will be eligible to receive a specified level of pension benefits. By and large, federal employees as well as congressional employees have the same commitment to public service that causes members of Congress to run for office. We ask a lot of our staffs, and with the downsizing incurring within the executive branch, federal employees also face greater and greater demands. I don't think we should dishonor the work of so many who have done so much, nor should we dishonor ourselves by breaking commitments that we know we already made in 1986. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentlelady, and now it's my honor to uh, uh, defer to the uh, vice chairman of our subcommittee, Mr. Bass. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity uh, that we're being given here to review uh, con uh, congressional, pen st congressional staff pensions. Two months ago, I didn't know anything about the federal retirement system, nothing. All I knew was that every time there was a job opening in my hometown in the post office, or any time there was a job opening in Manchester at the federal building, everybody fell all over themselves to get these jobs because they were the best paid jobs. They paid more than any other, anybody else in the community. The retirement system was considered to be so rich that it didn't compare with anything that private industry provided. In fact, most businesses in my district don't provide any retirement pension at all, only the major employers. And certainly members of Congress receive a deal that's even better than anybody in the federal workforce. And I haven't been here very long, and I'm sure what I say is subject to a certain amount of shaking of one's head and saying, I can't, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But I think I bring, as the newest member of this committee, or we're all new, it's a new subcommittee, a perspective that may be a little different because as a former member of the New Hampshire State Senate and the legislature before that, we have a retirement system for our state municipal employees, which is protected by the constitution of the state from legislative meddling and lobbying and so forth and the influence that the various groups have on the process, and it has to be fiduciarily sound. Now, when Mr. Micah made his opening statement, the chairman, the other day, I was absolutely flabbergasted to find out that our federal retirement system, including the military retirement system, has an unfunded liability of close to a trillion dollars. So when we talk about whether or not we're going to talk, have high three or high five, or whether we're going to have an employer contribution, or an employee contribution increase, or whether we're going to blend in congressional retirement and we're going to make things a little bit fairer, I think we have to keep our, our eye on the real issue here, and that is that this government is paying, as I understand it, up to a billion and a half dollars every year to a program that it, it, where there's no connection between the federal government payment and what the employer, employee, contribution, and so forth, it, it doesn't, work to, work, doesn't work together. If the gentleman would yield yes. just a second, that's a billion and a half, more than a billion and a half a month. Billion and a half a month. 19.7 okay. point seven a year. Billion Thank a year. you. Now, everybody says, I can't, you know, this is, this, is, this is what we've come to accept here in Washington. This is the way the system works. We just spend, we write out checks, we don't worry about who's paying for it. Well, I hope that, uh, I, I, I favor congressional parity. That's, that's not the real issue for me. The issue here is that over the coming months, we have to move to treat the federal retirement system the same way that every other retirement system in this country should or is or should be treated, and that is to bring it into some sort of fiduciary reality and do something to attack this massive unfunded federal liability that isn't being associated directly with the employer-employee contribution. Even if we raise 
the employer contribution to 100 percent of pay. At least then we're being honest about what the co true cost of this retirement system is. So I appreciate the fact that members of Congress are here today to talk about the congressional, uh, our responsibilities, congressmen to, congressmen to do here in our own in our own lives what we expect to have happen across the board. But over the long term, let's have the let's have this subcommittee look at the federal retirement system for what it really is, and that is a one and a half billion dollar per month subsidy from the federal government over and above the retirement system to the people who participate in that system. And with that, uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. And uh, now it's my honor to uh, introduce uh, for o an opening statement the uh, ranking member of our subcommittee, the Civil Service Subcommittee, gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Chairman Micah. Uh, we do very much respect your perspective and ideas, Mr. Bass, and I'm pleased that you're a member of the subcommittee. But the issue of an unfunded liability was brought up a decade ago. That's before all but, uh, I guess, Mr. Clinton, well, Mrs. Collins and Mr. Klinger were here, I believe, in the Congress at the time. Uh, and it was true at that time that there was a substantial unfunded liability in the CSRS program. And so two years were invested uh, in resolving how to address that real unfunded liability. It was a bipartisan effort. Uh, and in fact, uh, Senator Stevens was one of the leaders in coming to a resolution, which was to phase out the CSRS plan it was felt that it was somewhat too generous, uh, that in fact, since it had been deliberately scored on a static basis, which didn't take into account inflation and other factors that were increasing it year by year, that we had to go to a system that used the Social Security system, as private employers do, instead of relying upon the federal government to be the principal source of uh, retirement security for federal employees. So at the end of two years, the federal employee retirement system was uh, created. That system is fully funded. The CSRS system uh, is phasing out. Uh, no one goes into CSRS now. Uh, and uh, the idea of an unfunded liability is based upon assumptions that I think we will show in the course of this discussion are no longer valid, although they were very, uh, tr very much true 10 years ago before the system was fixed. The system is now fixed. What is not fixed is the budget deficit. And that is what is motivating this discussion rather than uh, problems inherent with the retirement system. Now, I don't think that uh, the members of Congress uh, ought to be here for the pay and benefits. And in fact, I can't imagine any of our colleagues who would not be making more money in the private sector with greater benefits. If they don't think they would be, they really ought not be in this job. And anyone who would run for this job because of the pay and benefits ought not be here. And I trust in short time they will not be able to maintain uh, the um, uh, the pace of activity, particularly intellectual activity, and, and their members will uh, dispose of them and put in somebody who uh, is prepared to make a sacrifice. I also believe that federal employees ought to be compensated commensurate with what other large corporations in the private sector pay their employees uh, in terms of uh, uh, a weekly paycheck, and in terms of benefits, secure retirement and health benefits. 
And that ought to be the standard by which we measure uh, the adequacy and appropriateness of federal retirement programs. Now, in testimony earlier this week, it was stated repeatedly and can be shown factually that 95% of private corporations uh, pay all their retirement contributions. Uh, and in fact, they also have Social Security to supplement their retirement. So while they may not increase retirement by cost of living increases, Social Security does do that. That's one of the reasons why COLA increase, cost of living increases in Social Security are such a controversial item and why so many people uh, feel that they are necessary because they are built into a private sector system of uh, retirement security. Uh, I think we ought to be moving toward a system where members of Congress get compensated uh, in the same way as federal employees uh, for work that is comparable uh, and that in fact our retirement system uh, is comparable to what you would be getting in the private sector, albeit that uh, we should uh, anticipate that we uh, would be compensated uh, higher in the private sector than we are under the federal government, and that's the way it ought to continue for members of Congress. Uh, but I want to make sure that whatever system we come up with, we are able to attract and to retain uh, the very best people up here for our own staffs and, in fact, within uh, the executive branch as well as the legislative branch. I think we owe that to ourselves, our immediate constituents, and we owe it to the taxpayers who uh, have a right to expect that we are going to be able to attract the best people into the federal service who can uh, carry out the programs that are funded with their taxpayers' money in the most efficient and effective manner. That's the ultimate objective for what we are uh, discussing uh, today and earlier this week and will continue uh, to on the House floor. So I, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're bringing up the subject, uh, but uh, we may have some perspective on our ultimate uh, difference in perspective on our ultimate objective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentleman, and I'd like to yield at this time to the uh, gentleman from, distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman. Mr. Gilman, do you have an opening statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just brief. I first of all want to thank you for calling uh, this session, and I hope that the hearing can be a forum for the exchange of constructive proposals as we continue in our efforts to review the federal retirement system and have a positive effect at the same time on the federal budget deficit. Accordingly, I want to welcome our colleagues who are witnesses to the subcommittee and look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, the gentleman, and I'd like to yield at this time to our distinguished uh, member from Pennsylvania, Mr. Mascara. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to say that we still seem to be moving at a breakneck speed down a path that will lead to a reduction of federal retirement benefits. During Tuesday's hearing, six of the eight members of the subcommittee, as well as the distinguished chairman of our full committee, expressed reservations and said that we should move more deliberately and look closely at the process. After all, ultimately, we will be affecting the lives of former and current employees who have worked a lifetime for their retirement. Anyone who has watched the Simpson trial or court TV knows that people are innocent until proven guilty. Here we are turning that axiom on its head. We are saying that federal retirement system is guilty and no trial is allowed. Beyond that testimony, we will hear today from our witnesses from the Government Accounting Office. We have had no experts before us. They have given us no detailed briefing. What exactly is the problem with the federal retirement system that so hurriedly needs fixed? No one has put up a chart showing the contributions made to the system and the benefits paid out. No one has explained 
or examine the system's actuarial soundness or alleged weakness. According to the Congressional Research Service, the system has a present trust fund balance of $340 billion, estimated to rise to $366 billion in the current fiscal year. Even the documents sent out by the Chairman indicate a trust fund balance of $311.7 billion as of September 30, 1993. I believe we reformed this in 1986. Uh, there was a 35-year program to bring the civil service retirement system into balance. This is a trust fund. Its funds are supposed to be dedicated to paying retirement benefits. The burning question is what is going on? This is a serious business and I think we should demand and I think we deserve answers. The testimony we are going to hear today regarding members' pension is equally as troubling. One of my fellow colleagues plans to testify that his intent is not to score cheap political points by bashing Congress. That's fashionable today. Well, my colleagues may be new here, but the way I read the testimony lined up for today, that is exactly what our witnesses are going to be doing. The message is, if you have served in Congress for more than 12 years, you do not deserve the pension you are entitled to. Shortly after we were all sworn in on January the 4th, Roll Call ran an article listing millionaires of Congress. If I recall correctly, the list included 45 members of the House and Senate. Needless to say, my name and the name of other, the other 490 members of the House and the Senate were not on that list. As a 65-year-old freshman member who is an accountant and has raised four wonderful children, my advice is rethink your position. We have a contract with our former and current employees. Many have planned their retirement based upon that contract that you or most of us signed when they came to work with the federal government. And finally, I want to say a word about the impact this plan will have on the congressional staff. You don't have to be around Congress too long before you realize these people work incredibly long hours and for not much pay. It is no secret that the turnover is great. There are no set hours. There is no job security. If your member loses, you lose. You are out of a job. It is very unlikely that more than 2 to 3 percent of the staff ever stay around here for the 20 to 25 years required to receive an immediate benefit. If I understand the proposed bill the Chairman has introduced, we are going to ask these senior staff members to contribute seven, several thousand dollars more per year. In return, their pension benefits are going to be computed on their five years of the salary instead of the high three under the current system. Guess what? This adjustment probably will cost them at least several thousand dollars a year in benefits. And why are we doing this? to help pay for a nearly $200 billion tax cut over five years. This is wrong. I hope our subcommittee members will back up a few steps and rethink what we are asked to do here in the near future. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentleman, and uh, it's my privilege now to yield to the very distinguished lady from uh, Maryland, Ms. Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I, I want to thank you for this second in a series of hearings so that we can get the total picture, having heard from the unions and other groups uh, earlier this week and now to hear from our colleagues as we look to downsizing government. I want to just reiterate the fact that we must always make sure that we um, recognize the fact that changes will have an impact on the morale and productivity. We must also look at breaching contracts. The thing I've heard is a guiding principle uh, from federal employees and others is this concept of equity, that we should not be treating one group unlike how we treat other groups. And so I, I know that uh, my colleagues will exercise the best judgment as we look to this situation, and I look forward to hearing from, from my colleagues. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentlelady, and I thank all of our uh, 
distinguished members of this panel for their opening comments. And now uh, uh, it is my responsibility to uh, introduce our first panel, uh, a very distinguished panel of uh, members of Congress. And we have a good friend, uh, Representative Howard Coble uh, from North Carolina, Representative Bob Goodlatte from Virginia, and Representative Dan Miller, a, a good friend uh, for many years uh, uh, and former roommate, I might add. Uh, but uh, I welcome each of you to our panelists this morning and our subcommittee. And I'd like to start, if I may, with uh, Mr. Coble. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, I applaud you, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member, Mr. Moran, for your foresight in holding this hearing to examine Federal Civil Service and members' retirement programs. <clears throat> this issue of members' retirement has been a hot button for me, Mr. Chairman, for in excess of a decade. In 1985, I introduced a bill to reform the Congressional Retirement Plan and amass the grand total of six co-sponsors. That proposal was designed to bring parity to fe uh, Federal Civil Service and members' pensions. On January 4th of this year, I, I reintroduced a more radical proposal. If it acted, my bill would terminate the Congressional pension for members who are not yet vested. In the 103rd Congress, I introduced an identical bill and was able to attract the grand total of four co-sponsors. By closing the pension system to the unusually large number of members in the most recent freshman class, my bill, it seems to me, would save taxpayers millions of dollars in the long run. Members were included, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, in the federal retirement system beginning in 1946, reportedly to induce them to retire and bring into the legislative service or process a larger number of younger members with fresh energy and new viewpoints. Instead, I believe this generous pension probably has had the opposite effect. The Congressional Retirement Plan <clears throat> costs the American taxpayers between 15 and 16 million dollars per year. As of the end of fiscal year 1993, the Office of Personnel Management report reported that there were 391 living former members of the Congress receiving a pension. Their federal service averaged 20.3 years and their annual average annual annuity was $44,479. The gentleman from New Hampshire in his opening statement implied this. You didn't say it directly, Mr. Bass. But I will extend that. The people who are unsung and forgotten in this process, it seems to me, are private sector employees, many of whom have no retirement at all, but who yet contribute very generously to what, in my opinion, is an inexcusably lavish plan for members of Congress. I have introduced a new sense of the Congress resolution urging that retirement benefits for members of Congress should not be subject to COLAs. Members' COLAs often allows members' pensions to exceed retirees' old salaries and have contributed to the perception of Congress as a pension millionaire's club. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports roughly 5 percent of private sector pension plan participants enjoy annual cost of living adjustments. And I say to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, I did not make the cut either on that list of millionaires that was appointed some time ago. I regret to say that I would like to have made the cut, but I didn't. And uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, I say to your able vi uh, ranking member, as Mr. Moran pointed out, I think probably most members of the Congress do not come here as a result of the retirement plan. I think most of them learn about it after they get off the ship 
and hit the ground. And I realize, my friends, and I do regard you all as my friends, I realize this is not going to make me uh, a candidate for Mr. Popularity in the 104th Congress. Uh, but I feel strongly about it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you and your subcommittee for having permitted uh, me to share this forum this morning. I thank you, sir. I thank the uh, gentleman uh, not only for his testimony and for your legislative recommendation, but also for keeping my popularity at a higher level. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to defer for uh, his uh, legislative uh, proposal. Uh, next, Mr. Goodlatte from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I too thank you for holding these hearings. I think this is a uh, uh, an important issue uh, as we address the overall issue of our uh, serious problems with the, the budget deficit and the national debt of this country. Uh, one of the uh, bills that we've already passed through this Congress was the Congressional Accountability Act. It passed the House Representatives, uh, I think unanimously, went to the, the uh, Senate where it also passed by a very wide margin and has been, since been signed into law by the President of the United States making members of Congress subject uh, to laws that we impose on other, in other words, equating equity between uh, what other people uh, should live by and what we live by. Uh, one area in that regard that we have not addressed is the disparity between uh, the pensions of members of Congress and the uh, pensions of other federal government employees. Uh, as it stands right now, under the new uh, FERS system, uh, members of Congress uh, accrue benefits uh, at a rate that's fully 70 percent higher than the accrual rate for top paid federal civil service retirees. So that, for example, uh, a member of Congress, assuming the high three salary formula uh, that's currently used uh, at the current congressional rate of pay and equating and for a year a 15 year uh, service period and equating that with uh, a federal government employee with the same salary, the same length of service, uh, the retirement for the member of Congress would be $34,000 and for the executive branch employee $20,000, uh, fully 70 percent higher for the congressional employees. This, I think, uh, is simply not a good standard to go by, especially as the committee has to look at uh, the overall impact uh, of the budget and what can or should be done uh, with p the pensions of all federal government employees. I also uh, take issue with my good friend from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, uh, regarding uh, the idea that there should be uh, no pensions whatsoever. I too am not a member of the Millionaires Club that has been uh, described here. Uh, far from it. Uh, but I think that uh, rather than looking at the impact of this on ourselves, we ought to look at the impact of this on the uh, importance of the message we send to people uh, who have families, who have a career, who may uh, well in the private sector uh, have a pension, and now are thinking about running for public office. And we want to encourage as much competition and as much uh, uh, offering of, of public service from as wide a uh, field of people, including people of a wide degree of economic backgrounds to run. And I'm a supporter of term limits. Uh, it's my feeling that members should come here and serve for a limited period of time. But uh, I think when they, and then go back to the private sector. But when they do that, I think that they ought to do it with the understanding that they are not going to completely give up uh, their retirement system in the process. Uh, so to me it seems fair that if we equate it with other federal government employees, whatever uh, the Congress sets that retirement level at, uh, they should not treat themselves in a better fashion. But I do not think that there should be a complete elimination of pensions uh, when you are talking about a si situation where people are making decisions uh, to leave the private sector uh, and serve in public office. The way that uh, my legislation uh, works is it would change the accrual rate to the same as other federal government employees, would reduce it from 1.7 percent to 1 percent, and it would raise the retirement age to the same as other federal government employees, which is an increase of five years. 
It does not affect any vested interests. It only applies to those who are elected after 1990. And uh, as a result, I think it is fair to those who may have come to rely upon the current situation. I think in that regard, the gentleman from North Carolina and I uh, do agree. Uh, I think his legislation also does, uh, does not pick up anybody who's, who's already vested under the program. So I, I would submit my, uh, my written testimony for the record uh, and uh, again thank the chairman and the committee for allowing me to testify. Without objection, your uh, testimony, full testimony, will be submitted uh, to the record. Uh, now I'd like to yield for his uh, legislative uh, proposal, the gen gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing and inviting us to participate. And I commend you and Chairman Klinger for the courage and boldness to have an issue that's such a sensitive issue here in Congress. Uh, as we have started here in the 104th Congress with a commitment to reduce the size and scope of the federal government, we have some very difficult challenges ahead, some very difficult choices ahead. As a member of both the Appropriations and Budget Committee, I'm very aware of these choices that we're going to be making over the next months. Next week, we're going to have a major rescission package before us, $17 billion out of the current fiscal year 95 budget, where we're going to eliminate over 100 programs of the federal government. During the month of May, we'll be having the 1996 budget, and we start that glide path to a balanced budget. And we have to stay focused on the need to balance the budget by year 2002 because it's so important, not just for us, but for future generations. And as we make these tough choices next week and throughout the summer as we take up the 13 appropriation bills, I feel it's appropriate that we start with ourselves, and I, that's the reason I commend you for having the hearing so early in the year. I didn't realize we would be able to address it at this early stage of the 104th Congress. I don't, when I first sent out my dear colleague last year, I was not attempting to try to bash Congress because we really, really want to attract the best and brightest in this country. And we do not want a Congress of just millionaires. We want successful people to leave their community as a believer in term limits for a limited amount of time and come to Congress and do the job of the people of this country. The issue of congressional pensions is sensitive and is a, people are aware of it out throughout the country. It's not a conservative or liberal issue. Robert Novak had an editorial in January saying we need to change it. The New York Times editorial wrote about it in January also. As a member of the Budget Committee, I was in Columbus, Ohio uh, over a month ago with a field hearing on the budget. And uh, two different people brought it up at a field hearing about going after congressional pensions. So we have to address the issue, and I commend you for bringing it up at this time. Let me make sure, clear what we have in our pension system. In 1984, the pension system was changed. Those members of Congress who entered prior to 1984 have a very, very generous pension. More generous than other federal employees and more generous than the private sector. In 1984 it was changed, and so those of us that are under the current system have a plan that is more generous than other federal employees and more generous than the private sector. Our plan, in addition to Social Security, has two components. A defined benefit plan, which is the traditional pension plan, and a thrift savings plan. The thrift savings plan is a 401k type of plan. We don't call it 401k because 401k refers to the tax code and for private corporations. The pension plan, as Mr. Goodlatte has pointed out, is, is quite generous in, in our accrual rate and our retirement age. Um, we contribute about $140 a month, but the amount we contribute doesn't necessarily relate to how much we receive. The thrift savings plan, we can set aside up to 10% of our pay uh, as capped as in a 401k at about $9,200 a year. The government will match, about 5%, uh, match up to 5% of our pay, which would be approximately $6,000. So that in, under our thrift savings plan, we can set aside $9,000 of our money, get $6,000 match. That is a 401k plan. That is what private industry is going to. And I think you'll have some experts from the private sector saying, this is what everybody's going to in the country. They're going away from the defined benefit plan because of the huge unfunded liability that the federal government has and all your major corporations we should be going in the same direction as I think the private sector has gone. What my plan does is does away with the defined benefit plan for members of Congress only. And it is not retroactive. I don't think that's morally right or legally right to go retroactive. So anybody that's contributed to their pension plan will keep that particular pension plan. I want to keep the thrift savings plan, the 401k plan. This is the right thing, I think, for the employer, in this case the government, and the employee. And let me tell you why it's right for the employee. And this is true in the private sector. If you come to Congress and only serve four years, you leave, what do you have in retirement? You have nothing besides Social Security. Under a 401k, you get to keep what you have contributed. 
And if you go to, say, the state government, you come, get four years of retirement and leave, you have nothing unless you have a 401k. If you go in the military and you serve 15 years and retire, you don't get a retirement. You have nothing. You should accumulate your retirement and allow the people to move between job to job, from state to state, and have benefits that accumulate. It's the right thing for the employee, and it's also the right thing long term, I think, for the employer, whether it's the federal government or Ford Motor Company or a small business back in Sarasota, Braden, Florida. So I think it's the right the direction to go. I commend you. I commend you for at least going to the step that we're going to equalize our pension as the same as all federal employees. And I encourage you to start looking at the 401k concept because I think it's right for everybody in the country, employers, taxpayers, and certainly for the employees. Thank you for having this panel. I thank the gentleman and I thank all of our witnesses uh, for their uh, testimony and also for explaining and taking time to explain their uh, legislative proposals. Uh, uh, to the subcommittee this morning. I have a couple of quick questions. Uh, first, uh, for Mr. Coble, uh, I noticed in your resolution you um, uh, suggest that members, current members of uh, Congress do not uh, get COLAs. One of the problems uh, that has actually precipitated some of the criticism of former members is that they've gotten these uh, repeated COLAs. You don't address the question of uh, uh, COLAs for former members of Congress uh, who've already retired. Uh, how would you uh, suggest we uh, approach that uh, problem? Well, I didn't address it, Mr. Chairman, but I would not be averse to addressing it. I would be very flexible on that end. I guess I did not direct attention there because, as the gentleman from Florida said, when you start delving into pensions that are already vested, I think that becomes more rigid and more inflexible as opposed to those who have uh, those members who are not yet vested. Uh, I thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Miller. If we adopt uh, term limits, do you believe members of Congress should then be excluded from the uh, retirement system? <laughs> No, I don't. We want to attract the best and brightest into Congress. And so I think we need to give a, a pension similar to what the private sector is offering, at least for the big corporations. Uh, my bill, which I did not mention in my opening statement, is uh, I cap uh, participation in the thrift savings match part for 12 years, because I'm a believer of the citizen legislators that come up and serve, in, in my case, I think a maximum of 12 years. After 12 years under my proposal, you can continue to put your money into the thrift savings plan. It's just that there will be no federal match for it. So I think we should allow people to have a pension because we want to attract the best and brightest. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goodlatte, uh, your bill doesn't change the current law that allows members of Congress to opt out of the FERS system, which is the current system that we're under. Other federal employees uh, are not given the same option. I've been looking at some legislative proposals that may give them that option also. Um, what, what is your opinion uh, about uh, that and is there any reason that you didn't uh, allow them the same uh, privilege that uh, members of Congress have? Uh, I would have uh, no objection and certainly be willing to, to work with the chairman uh, on, on this particular legislation if the committee would go forward with, with that. I think they, they should be parallel and uh, we would certainly want them to be parallel. <clears throat> well, I um, thank you for your response and uh, what I would like to do at this point is uh, I think we have Congressman Mingi uh, with us uh, who wanted to associate uh, himself with uh, certain uh, remarks of the panelists and uh, then was going to uh, depart. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to appear here briefly. I would like to emphasize that there's a bipartisan group that is also uh, advocating pension reform for members of Congress and uh, many of our proposals uh, are parallel to what's being heard here and I will not uh, go into that except to say that I'm a, appearing not just on my own behalf, but also on behalf of uh, uh, Congressman uh, Jay Dickey, um, uh, Klug, Castle, Shays, Deal, Barrett, and a couple of others who are uh, uh, sort of stretching across the aisle to try to work on a bipartisan basis so that uh, uh, we can move together as members of Congress rather than um, as uh, individuals. Thank you. But well, I appreciate the uh, gentleman from Minnesota's uh, comments and. Uh, Without objection, we'll make your comments and the comments of the other members part of the record and appreciate your also, also your cooperative uh, effort in trying to help us uh, reach some uh, um, 
real conclusions here and uh, also to try to get uh, the system into some uh, corrective uh, nature. Uh, I would like to uh, yield at this time to the chairman of the full committee for questions, uh, Mr. Klinger. Thank you, sir. I have no questions. Uh, All right. Mr. Klinger has no questions. I'll defer now to the ranking uh, chairperson of, of the uh, full committee, Mrs. Collins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Coble, let me, uh, your, your bill, as I understand it, would make the newer members of Congress who are not yet vested and eligible to participate in a retirement program. Now, I think that being a member of Congress is a, is a full-time job, and uh, it just seems to me that if we want members to give their full time and attention to their responsibilities in Congress, that we should also want them to participate fully in a retirement system. You don't agree with that? No. Just absolutely don't. Don't, Ms. Collins. I'm sorry. We, we, we can agree to disagree agreeably on that issue. Well, if you notice, I, I didn't give you a zinger back on that one. So we're, 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 we're okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I didn't mean to imply that you were being disagreeable. I, but I think <laughs> in many instances in this body, oftentimes we find ourselves at odds with one another. And I think the secret is to do that with a smile on, on your face, as you just did, as I just did. Fine. Mr. Uh, Goodlatte, uh, you mentioned that in your opening statement here that we have that your legislation would affect all members who were elected after 1990, but I have your bill, H.R. 575, and it doesn't say that in your bill. Uh, I, if you would uh, allow me, uh, what I would tell you is that this bill was originally introduced in the last Congress, uh, and the uh, savings provision uh, does provide for uh, any annuity or portion of any annuity computed based on service performed before the effective date of this act shall be If you'll computed. excuse me, the bill is dated January the 19th, 1995. Well, I understand. When, when, so we, re when we reintroduce the bill, we Since should have time? corrected that oh. to indicate, uh, you see, when it was introduced in the last Congress, it would have applied in that fashion because the effective date would have only covered people elected in 1992 and thereafter. Uh, now it would need to be amended to reflect 1992 and thereafter because now it would effectively only be 1994. So uh, the, the gentlewoman has a very good point uh, and the bill would need to have that uh, correction made to it. On Tuesday, witnesses testified that in 1986 the Congress and the Republican administration and employee groups spent two years, as Mr. Uh, Moran has said, uh, developing the proposal to reform the civil service retirement program. Uh, your bill makes a contribution rate for members uh, that they have to pay for their pensions, Mr. Go uh, Goodlett, under the FERS program, the same as federal employees have to pay. It also equalizes the agency contribution for members' pensions with that that applies to employee pensions. Uh, I notice, however, that the contribution rates applicable to congressional employees are left in change. It appears that your bill does not affect congressional employees at all and it just appears only to affect the member's pension. Could you tell me why you wrote your bill in that manner? The, the uh, effort here was to say that members of Congress uh, uh, subjecting themselves, as with the Congressional Accountability Act, to the same laws that everybody else is subject to would be subject to those laws. Uh, I would have no objection whatsoever to having the same uh, parallel for congressional employees as well but I leave that to, to the committee's discretion whether that should be added to the bill. One other question for you, uh, Mr. Coble. I know, uh, let me ask you, um, it, it, I, have, I have a concern because I know that you've been here a while, and uh, I wonder if you've been here more than five years in the Congress? I'm, I'm in my 11th year. You're in your 11th year. And well, it just seemed kind of strange to me that um, those of us who have been here longer than in five years would, would have any kind of bill that would deny a pension benefit to members who have not yet vested because that would eliminate those of us who have been here that period of time. It wouldn't be quite fair to those who are the newer members. So well, I'm it's sure not you that have unfair a, a to me because I'm not, ex I'm not a beneficiary of the pension plan, so I don't think I'm being uh, in any way hypocritical. You're not a benefit? You did not choose to take a pension? I'm... You will not choose? I have not. I will not take the pension. And they don't take any money out of your pay for pensions? Indeed, they do not. All right. Thank you. You've cleared it up for me. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions Mr. at this Mr. time. Mr. Chairman, may I, I say back to Mrs. Yes. Uh, yes. 
call yes, the first ahead. question. I, I don't mean to imply, folks, that, that I'm indifferent uh, to those people who are here because I think on balance most of the people in the Congress are good people. And, and Ms. Collins, if we had the luxury of a credit balance, if we had more money than we could uh, had that had that luxury, I probably wouldn't be so hell bent on these this reform path that I pursue. But folks, we're in trouble fiscally in this country, and I just feel like that maybe looking at at the members' retirement plan might be a convenient first step that I believe would be favorably received by our constituents. Mr. Chairman, there's also a trust factor here. We made a, a, a legitimate contract with federal employees and with congressional employees, and I think that we ought to keep that. I think the trust factor is something that every American would want us to do. We're about a country that believes in openness and honesty. And when we tell an employee, federal or congressional, which they both seem to be, that we're going to have a contract with them for their retirement benefits, we ought to be about the business of keeping that. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. And I also thank uh, Mr. Coble for his comment that <coughs> uh, members of Congress are good people, and because I know that's inclusive, and it would include the chair even for holding this hearing. Uh, certainly include the chair, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'd like to yield. I would like to yield now to the, our Vice Chairman, Mr. Bass. Chairman, Mr. Coble, um, I, I uh, would just like to remark on your, on your comment that you, at the end of your testimony that you said that the introduction of this legislation would not make you a candidate for Mr. Popularity. Uh, you don't need to be a candidate for Mr. Popularity because you won that election years and years ago. So uh, I would suggest that uh, commend you for introducing this, this bill because I think it's important. But I would like to associate myself with the comments of the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mrs. Collins, in asking you why you think that me or somebody who was, or Mr. Mascara, or somebody who was elected to Congress after 1990 really doesn't deserve any pension at all, whereas somebody elected prior to that date who was working just as long hours and doing the same kind of work side by side deserves something different. Well, that, that was a judgment call that I made when I, when I drew the bill. That may be, you may disagree with that, but uh, that was my call. And I think I had to draw the line uh, at vesting. And I don't believe, I think I would be skating on dangerously thin ice if I directed attention uh, that would, to a bill that would cover everyone in the Congress. I just don't believe that would fly as a matter of law. Uh, but I believe that uh, those who are not yet vested, I, I do think that is not an unsound approach. Thank you, Mr. Coble. Mr. Goodlatte, it's my understanding that your piece of legislation essentially brings members of Congress and staff into parity with the rest of the federal employee workforce? Well, as been, has been noted by the uh, ranking minority member of the full committee, uh, it only applies to members of Congress. It would certainly be uh, something to consider whether it also should apply to congressional staff. But it does uh, reduce uh, congressional employee pensions for those uh, with an amendment elected after 1990 and would uh, bring them into parity with other uh, federal employees. That is correct. I think the disparity that we have right now is not at all justifiable uh, given our commitment to being uh, accountable and being brought into parity with others with other legislation that we've passed recently. And one last question, which you don't have to answer unless it affects any of the four of you. When you ran for election to Congress, did any of you ever think for one minute about your retirement or what it was? Did you know? Did, did, was that an issue in your campaign? If, if I might respond to that, I was uh, uh, too busy uh, campaigning to, to wonder whether I was going to be here at all and uh, certainly did, was not affected by the idea of what this pension would be. But I think once you get here and find out that there is a disparity, I think it uh, uh, is, is something that uh, we should pay attention to because I do think it does not set the right example. If I may respond as well, it was not a consideration for me, but I can tell you that with respect to the voters, they brought it up. Uh, quite often and not so much what I thought mine would be, but what did I think the right uh, course of action would be for those already in Congress. 
Mr. Bass, in, in my case, uh, I, I made it an issue, perhaps in applying retrospective hindsight, maybe foolishly so, I was opposing a one-term congressman who had not yet vested, so it was no issue. But I, as a state legislator, I came across some information one day that uh, in, during which time I became thoroughly educated about the what I thought was the inexcusable lavish pension that was on online in the Congress. And I just, it was, it was a self-appointed issue that I created, and as my friend says, once it began being discussed, then constituents picked up on the idea. And I think this has happened more notably in the past eight to ten years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, the gentleman, and now I'd like to yield to our ranking uh, subcommittee <coughs> member, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin with my friend, Mr. Miller. You, you've done a lot of work on this, Dan. Uh, I like charts and so on in congressional testimony. On page six, you say that um, the, uh, uh, the current retirement system encourages members to stay in office for a minimum of 30 years or up to age 62. Since you've done so much research, uh, what is the average length of service for the current members of Congress? I'm not sure you can calculate an average. I don't know. We have some people, Jamie Witten just retired after all, close to 50 years in service. So I'm not sure what the average is. Okay. I, high turnover. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it, it's a fairly short period of time on average. In fact, I, I heard that the majority now have been elected uh, since 1990? Is that possible? It's right at 50% since 1990. Yeah. And so that's something, just from their, per, the people that only stay here for two years or four years have nothing when they leave here. At least they should be able to have their 401k savings unless they participate in it. Um, that's that's going to be their pension. So that's the reason I support the 401k concept and I support it for, you know, throughout industry that yeah. we're seeing. But, but that's not a new concept. We, that's what we have now, the FERS system. Right, but we have both a 401k and a pension plan, not just 401k. No, well, I understand that, but we, in 86, we incorporated the plan that we applied to federal employees, which was basically a 401k, right. so that you contribute to a retirement system. Now, one of the problems with that system, and I'm sure you'll uh, recognize this, particularly being on the Budget co Committee, is that the contributions to that system are outlays. Whereas the prior system uh, is budget authority, but not outlays. No money is going out of the federal government. And so the CBO doesn't score it as an outlay. It doesn't increase the deficit. It's an intergovernmental fund transfer, but no real money changes hands. It's, a, it's an accounting uh, uh, mechanism. But it is not uh, scored as it should not be for outlays. And that's the difficulty of going from this system to that other system. And, and the 401k, you're taking taxpayers' money and you're putting it, taking it out of the government so that it, it, it doesn't, uh, what we do now, as you know, with Social Security, we, we finance the deficit. And, and essentially, the CSRS plan was financing the deficit too. We, we put in treasury bills in place of money. And, uh, but with a 401k, we, we send money out, uh, out of the general account. Um, but the, uh, you contend that we have this encouragement to stay 30 years, and yet the, uh, the average length of stay is, what, about two and a half terms or something at this point. So it can't be a terribly strong encouragement, which seems to bolster the points that have been made that that uh, members aren't in public service for the retirement plan and they aren't staying because of the retirement plan either. Well, the, the debate of, of term limits we're going to have later on this month, I am a believer of term limits and I will support the 12-year term limit. But your 
earlier statement saying, well, you know, about budget authority now versus later on. That's what's getting us into the problem. That's the problem we're going to have to address about Social Security as it starts running into financial trouble in, in the next century. Uh, and this plan, and we're talking about as earlier statements, that we're close to a trillion dollars of unfunded liability. Uh, we've had to create the pension guarantee program in the federal government because corporations have had troubles with this unfunded liability. It's a dangerous thing sitting out there, and we're putting our head in the sand if we don't start addressing it. And further in the future. I agree and we need to look at the full budget implications of the fact that you know when you do 401k it goes right into this year's uh, budget. So I, I agree with you on that point. Well, and with regard to the unfunded liability, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, the new plan that we set up to deal with the prospective unfunded liability, which was deliberately created because they went to a static system instead of a dynamic system, uh, it was fixed. Uh, approximately 10 years ago, and, and the first plan is fully funded now. Uh, and in fact, we're taking in $62 billion a year and, and sending out $36 billion. And, and so when those plans converge, CSRS and FERS, because FERS is what's growing and CSRS members are declining, uh, it, the, uh, we're not going to get into a situation where uh, any unfunded uh, liability would uh, would result and um, uh, and in fact it would cause problems with our uh, deficit imbalance if we were to take money out of the general fund uh, presumably to fund this unfunded liability and the unfunded liability figure is based upon an assumption there's going to be inflationary increases and and uh, uh, with the federal government that you'll have any number of pay increases which which haven't even happened in the last few years. You know, the coal increases, for example, are built into this assumption of this unfunded liability figure and we cut the coal, the cost of living increase, uh, as you know, and, and we'll probably make that permanent beginning in April instead of, of January. So uh, we will get into those more technical factors later, but there was one other uh, question that I wanted to ask since so much research has been done and, and by all of you, and, and any of you can provide the figures. How does the member's retirement system match up to what you would be getting if you were an executive in a uh, private corporation? Well, there are several outside consultant groups that represent the retirement industry, and I, hopefully you'll have some of those type experts in. And I've talked with some of these and over with CRS. It's hard to generalize, very difficult to generalize about pensions in general. So uh, uh, as far as what are the 401k, and if you see a, a graph in my, uh, one of my charts shows how the, uh, there has been the decrease in the pension systems versus an increase in the uh, page four, a dramatic increase in the, in the defined contribution, which is a 401k plan in the past five years, and that trend is going to continue. Um, but it, there is no really hard facts. I'd rather let the experts do it. We've got some materials. and. Uh, but they're going to tell you it's going to be hard to totally generalize. But there's no question the 401k is the question, the direction that people no, are going. I understand going that. To. But but isn't it true that most private corporations provide a pension, 95 percent of which is fully funded by the corporation without it, the employee's required share, yeah. and that they supplement that private pension with the social security system. So that most people in the private sector, if we were executives in the private sector, we would be getting two sources of retirement. The corporate pension plan, which for 95% of the cases is going to be funded by the corporation entirely, plus social security, which would give you built-in cost of living increments. Well, the number of companies that offer, actually offer a defined, a defined benefit plan is, it seems like it's 20 some percent, but we get the number. But as Mr. Bass said up in New Hampshire, I mean, most people aren't with the General Motors and Ford Motor Companies to have access to a defined benefit plan. And so the vast majority of Americans don't even have a pension. And they have IRAs. I, before I came to Congress, I was able to participate in an IRA plan. It's the only thing I had. I was in a small company, which I was one of the owners of, but we did not have a pension plan. We did not even have a 401k. The majority of Americans don't have either, unless you're with a big corporation. And it's big corporations have gone, have gone through their downsizing. They've had major financial problems, as we know, 
because of that unfunded liability. And some of them have basically been on the verge of bankruptcy without having the, the resources to pay for those benefits. That's the reason the federal government had to stand in. So are we more generous or less generous than executives? I think it's going to be hard to find comparison, but there's no question. I think we're more generous than federal employees, and I think that's definitely the right step and the first step we should go to Mr. Goodlett's bill or what is, I think is proposed in Mr. Micah's bill. Well, I'm not sure that our goal should be to search for the lowest common denominator for members' retirement system, but uh, uh, that my time is, uh, is up this morning. I thank the gentleman, and I'd like to defer now to for questions, uh, the purpose of questions, Mrs. Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, because I noticed you've got a long list of uh, panelists for the second panel and then um, the third panel, too, and many of our colleagues are waiting. I'm just going to ask one question. First of all, I want to thank you for preparing the legislation, for the kind of commitment you've displayed. We may agree or not agree, and of course, Mr. Coble, your uh, proposition really is term limits, isn't it? I mean, if, if there isn't anything beyond uh, a certain period uh, uh, or anything for them, they're not going to not going to want to stay on very long, I would think. I think it becomes a consideration ultimately. But I'm just wondering, could you, could you comment on whether or not there would be any savings in your plans? I'm curious about whether it's motivated because of savings, whether it's principle, whether it's symbol. Could you tell me if there will be savings as you've looked at it? Is this one of the motivations? And if so, what would it be? So I guess I could start off with either Mr. Goodlatte or Mr. If I might respond to Ms. Morella, the, the Congressional Budget Office hasn't scored uh, my bill as of yet to determine what those savings would be, but yes, there would be a reduced government contribution corresponding to the fact that the pension itself would be reduced. And I think it would be true, and I'll let them speak to it, I think it would be true of all these plans. And that certainly is uh, a motivation. The taxpayer expects to see savings, and the taxpayer's complaint about uh, high congressional pensions is that they're uh, having to foot that bill. And so as a result, that's, that's certainly a motivation. Uh, in my case, I think it's also uh, important that we send the right message regarding not according ourselves any benefits that are uh, superior uh, to others who are in government service. And so as a result, I think that I have both of those motivations. I would agree with Mr. Goodlatte. I, the total pension system, as Mr. Coble was saying, is in the 15 to 20 million dollar a year cost for, for members of Congress only we're talking about. So the total dollars is obviously not going to balance the budget, but it's the symbolic. As we start reducing the size and scope of the government in Washington, we're going to be having to make cuts in a number of programs and reducing the spending. And next week we're going to have a major rescission package that's going to have a lot of cuts. We're eliminating programs. And that's the reason I think it's so important that we start with ourselves and say we're no different than all other federal employees as a minimum. And then I think the sound idea is to go to the 401k concept. So you see it mostly as a, the concept of the perception of the public with regard to their uh, public servants and not so much as a way to save money that's going to bring us toward a balanced budget in any way or be any significant amount of savings. That's, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to add that this comment, the concept of shared sacrifice is very important. And I think that uh, when we're talking about the general population, if uh, school lunches or, for, or something else like that is on the block, on the table, that we at the same time have to, as members of Congress, take a commensurate cut in the benefits that we receive. But at the same time, we should not be punitive. And uh, to say that as members of Congress, we should somehow uh, be uh, treated as second-class citizens, I, I think is wrong as well. I thank the uh, gentlelady and uh, yield at this time to Mr. Mascara. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to go back to the issue of the reform that took place in 1986. And, and, and I commend you, gentlemen, for the work that you've done in attempting to bring all of this to light and, and attempt at some reform. But what happened to the reform that took place that said that over a 35-year period that somehow we were going to make the civil service retirement system whole? And what are we going to do with the $340 billion surplus? And I understand there's another $26 billion surplus that will be added this year. Uh, and, and the general lady from Maryland asked about the, the savings. And I'm interested that if we're going into a major reform that affects people's lives who have worked a lot of years and, and their 
the years when they were young and could have gone someplace else, especially a gentleman who wrote a letter that was read at the last uh, committee hearing that said he gave his best years to this government and planned for retirement. Now somehow this government, an uncaring government, and I agree, uh, Ms. Morella, some of this is sanitized political rhetoric. I don't think we can look at reform, true reform, unless we have all of the numbers. I'm sitting here without a budget, and you're asking me to make decisions that affect people's lives, people who have worked for this government for a lot of years. Can you tell me the kinds of savings that are going to be effectuated as a result of these cuts? Can you tell me that? Can you tell me where that money is going to go? Is it going to go for a tax cut? Is it going to be specified that it be used for deficit reduction? I hardly think, you know, I'm not a young kid anymore, and I've lived a long time. I'm not here for a pension. I didn't come here for a pension. But what is going on here upsets me, that this rush, this mad rush to do something to tell the American people that we're no different than anybody else. That's fine. That, that, that sounds good, and I'm sure that plays well back on Main Street in the town you live in. But as an accountant, none of this makes any sense. And, I, you know, I think we have an obligation to the millions of people who have worked for this government, who have given their life to this government, to make sure we're doing the right thing. I agree we need to do something, but not in the time frame that is being set by this Congress. Mr. Mascara, this hearing and all of our bills are on specifically just members' pensions. So, I mean, we're, you know, my expertise or knowledge, what I've been working on, is just our pensions and not the to I, I total system. That. And I commend you. I think we need to look at it, and I'm looking forward to the reports coming out of this committee. But, I mean, we're here to say that we should I not have a different that. pension than other federal employees. And I I'm think talking about the whole picture because we're talking about saving money. We're talking about reform. You gentlemen did reform in 1986. And all of a sudden, that, form, that reform is no longer good. I mean, I don't understand. Who's responsible for investing the monies that are paid into this fund? Who has the fiduciary responsibility to make sure that these funds are being invested properly? And what, kind, what rate of return are we getting on the money that we're putting in and that the employees are putting into this fund? Anybody have those answers? I think those are excellent uh, questions, but I would join the gentleman from Florida in saying that as you work through that, uh, by all means, make sure that we don't set the example of saying that somehow members of Congress are exempt from uh, such a process. And that's what my bill, my bill is forward looking and says uh, there will be savings in the future with regard to congressional pensions, but let's uh, make sure uh, first and foremost uh, that we don't say that members of Congress should be treated differently uh, than the many, many federal employees that are in your district and my district and most of the other uh, uh, people in this room. Well, I work long and hard. I've only been here two months. I go home many nights at midnight. I'm not going to apologize to anybody for anything I might get. There aren't any perks here. They're all gone. So nobody can accuse me of taking a perk. But I'm not going to apologize for my job as a United States Congressman. I'm proud to be here. I work hard, and I am different. When I'm up there at midnight, I don't see anybody around. So why shouldn't we be considered in maybe a different light? Yeah. I work 16, 18 hour days. So don't tell me I should be treated on an even keel with everybody. That is rhetoric. That is, there's a difference. And you have to look to see the difference. If there's no difference, then I'm going home. I don't, I don't need to be here. Mr. Mascara, if I may put my oars in the water, I, I'm not sure that we are all that different. Many times I'll call people back in my home, small businessmen, small business women, at 9 and 9.30 at night, and they're still there working. And they've been there probably since 6 o'clock that morning. Thank you. So I'm not so sure that we are that much different well, in our hard maybe, work. Not in that light, sir. There are a lot of, I worked uh, as hard when I was in the private industry than I am in government. That, the point I'm trying to make is let's not strip the last vestiges of dignity that the members of Congress should have. And if you're not proud to be a United States Congressman, then you shouldn't be here. There's a little bit of a difference. Well, I, I don't think we're doing that. No, I don't not think at all. I, I plead not guilty to that. Okay, fine. <laughs> well, Mr. Mascara, if I might uh, And I support to that term too. limits, too. Well, <laughs> uh, we're, we're glad to have your support. Uh, uh, if I might respond to that as well, 
there are many people in not only not only in the the uh, private sector but also uh, federal government employees uh, who work hard and I don't think we're in a position to judge uh, on that point I'm very proud of my service in the Congress I'm very honored to have the opportunity to be here but I think that the public expects us to treat this position uh, in such a way that we do not appear to be treating ourselves preferentially with others and while we do put in very long hours uh, we do so because we are motivated to do so and not because of these pensions And I think what we should do is say uh, that that's not the point we were, are perfectly willing to have the same pension as another government employee I'll just make one final point Mr. Chairman we're going too fast let's not make that mistake there's a lot at stake here for everybody, the employees, current and past employees, and future employees. There's, there's enough time here. We can sit down and debate. I think we're on the right track. Let's do it right. Let's do it properly. Mr. Chairman, if I may say so to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, sir, I've been, I've been on this track since 1985. I don't think that's going too fast. Well, I thank the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania. I want to also take this opportunity to thank our panelists uh, and each of you for your legislative proposals and discussing them with our subcommittee this morning. This is a very sensitive uh, issue uh, uh, for all, all of the members of Congress and w with the American public and we want to address it fairly and honestly and openly and uh, have a good discussion about it and you've provided that forum and those vehicles so we appreciate your participation and also Mr. Mengi uh, you can see there's a wide diversity of opinion on this uh, amongst our members but I thank you and uh, I'll excuse the panel at this time and I would like to uh, next call up, um, I don't see all of the freshman panel here, but I'd like to call on Mr. Murtha, who is in the next panel, if he would come up. He is a senior and distinguished member of uh, Congress, has uh, served many uh, years with distinction, Mr. Murtha from Pennsylvania. And Mr. Murtha, if you would, uh, I know you've been waiting patiently, uh, we'd like to uh, ha go ahead and have your testimony at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, distinguished members uh, of this committee. I've been involved uh, in this process because of my position on the Legislative Appropriations Subcommittee uh, for 15 years. And uh, uh, let me give you a little background of what we've gone through over the years. First of all, 1920 is when they first established the Congressional uh, uh, Retirement System, or the uh, Civil Service Retirement System, Congress was not included. The legislative body wasn't included until 1946. Interesting thing. They tried to include when 1942. There was something, such an uproar, they had to repeal it and uh, finally uh, enact it in 1946. But 1984, uh, because of the excesses, because of the problems we had under the Civil Service Retirement Plan, uh, we did, uh, we, we put everybody in Congress uh, that works for Congress under the Social Security system. And uh, at that time we decided we had to get rid of the excesses and, and reform the overall retirement system. Uh, we we uh, took two years we looked at big systems, we looked at little systems, we looked at every retirement system you could find. And we didn't pick the biggest or the best, we didn't pick the smallest or the worst, we picked what we felt was a good retirement system for anybody that works for the, for the legislature. We talked to consultants, benefit experts, actuaries, economists, personal directors of major firms, I mean we were across the board. Two years we studied the, the uh, system. Our objective was to design a system to modernize the federal retirement system to meet the workforce management needs of the government and offer portable benefits. Now this is an important point. The old system had no portability. If you worked for the government before, even if you were vested, you couldn't, you had no benefits. You left the government and you had absolutely no benefits uh, until we put uh, Social Security under, put us under Social Security and at the same time uh, we added uh, uh, the thrift plan where we could uh, donate uh, and contribute to the thrift plan. Now congressional research tells me that after eight years, half the federal employees are under the new system. 
So it's working. What we did then is working out. Uh, half are under the old system, half are under the new system. Now, th the benefit accrual rate, we changed. We thought it was too high. Under the, the federal uh, system, which we call FERS, uh, we went from 2.5 down to 1.7. That's in the, in the congressional or, or the legislative branch. And, and why did we leave it at 1.7? We left it at 1.7 because we wanted to front load it. We thought it was important that, that members, because they only stay an average of between five and eight years, ought to have an opportunity to have a little better pension plan. And of course, they go on back into industry or private, uh, private practice or something like that. Now, that's for the first 20 years. After 20 years, actually, the accrual rate drops to 1%, which is less than the federal employees. So the, the, the congressional uh, plan is actually less than after 20 years of the other empl federal employees. They go up to 1-1, one, one, and we go down to 1 after 20 years. We, we feel we removed the we scaled back the inflation protection of the formula and the cost of living. Instead, of any COLA over 3%, you got 1% less. And no one in the congressional plan gets any COLA until they're age 62. We saw all kinds of stories about the amount of money that people were getting. Actually, some members of Congress uh, retired some members of the legislative branch retired, getting more money than people working. We obviously thought that was excessive, and we changed it, uh, we think, uh, uh, dramatically. W one of the reasons we felt it was so important, the average life of the staff, legislative staff, this doesn't count the support staff, but I'm talking legislative staff, three years, less than three years. The average person stays here. The average member of Congress, if you don't include the, the, the uh, new group who just came in, is eight years, four years. I mean, we talk about term limits. Term limits are two years. And everybody that works for us goes out in two years. So if members have this kind of a turnover, there's absolutely no uh, uh, job security at all. To the mem for the people working for, uh, for us. And, and I don't have to tell you stories about uh, people that work for us on the Hill. They work long hours. They are underpaid. They have to travel an average of an hour to get to work because of the quality of life. They, they don't make enough money to, to own something that's close in. I know not long ago I was trying to get rid of some of the people in the, in the Navy Department that are working in here, here close, and I said, look, we have to move some of these folks out, of, out a little bit, and Moran doesn't like to hear me tell his story. But I, I said, show your hands here. How many people travel an hour and a half to work every day? Over half the people in the room raised their hands at how far they have to travel to work, and they're not making big salaries. And that's a concern I have about uh, what we're doing in, in, in the pension plan. Now, how many members of Congress? If you read the papers, you would think that there's thousands of members of Congress retired and on retirement. 381 members of Congress are living and on retirement. 381. That's all. It amounts to $15 million a year. So we're taking a chance and punishing the people, the professional staff who have worked here for years if we go to a plan that uh, uh, some folks are proposing. And I understand uh, their proposal. Uh, I have to talk about uh, Fred Mormon, who was a former executive director of the Appropriations Committee. This guy comes to work at 6.30 in the morning, and he leaves after we do, because we leave when the last vote's over, and most of the staff is, are here after we're gone. And of course, uh, uh, the long hours the committee staff has to work, I don't, uh, I don't need to talk about with the preparation of legislation, the weekends that you put in. And what Mr. Mascara said is absolutely true, and I know John Mike has been involved for years in politics. You're not home when you go home. You're out working uh, the district. Uh,
members stay eight years or less. Uh, my, my recommendation is a couple things. One, that we don't rush into changing the system. Two, that we consider, instead of some of the recommendations I've heard, we consider a flat COLA. Now, this proposal has been made before. I mentioned it to a number of people, and, and most of them don't like the idea. I've tried to get the savings and the amount of money it would save. People, I think, are, re are entitled to the retirement plan as we did it in 1986, as we redid it. I don't think we ought to change it. I think we ought to grandfather everybody in, including the folks that came in this year, into the retirement system. Then, I think instead of some of the recommendations I've heard is consider a flat COLA. Now, what do I mean by a flat COLA? I'm not talking about uh, a percentage COLA. I'm talking about if the lowest level of the CPI makes $500, then everybody ought to get $500. I think this would be a unique experiment if we're going to change the retirement system, and I don't recommend we change it, but it would be a unique experiment for a small number of people compared to the 3 million people that work for the federal government. We have 19,000 that work for the legislative branch. And we could see how it works out. For instance, uh, the person making uh, uh, $130,000 a year, as members of Congress do, should get the same amount of CPI as the member that's making $10,000 when they're retired. And uh, I think that's something that we'll have to consider in the future when we look at the COLA situation. Uh, I don't remember exactly when COLA started, but I know it's caused a tremendous problem. It's helped an awful lot of people at the lowest level. But to me, for us to get such a high COLA is uh, 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 out of line with the benefits as they should be. So if we just, uh, we, did the, we keep it exactly the same as it is, we grandfather people in, and we look at the possibility of having a flat COLA, I think it might solve our problem. And with that, I'd be delighted uh, to answer any uh, suggestions or, or questions that you have. I thank <coughs> my colleague uh, for his testimony and also for the historic perspective that uh, he brings uh, to the subcommittee uh, in his testimony. Um, one of the uh, things that I have done in the last 24 hours is introduce legislation that, that does increase the um, employee contribution uh, to the retirement system. Uh, we, we have an outflow right now of about a billion and a half dollars a, a month, 19.7 billion dollars a year. One of the problems we have in, in earlier testimony or earlier comments, we heard that, that nobody's, uh, uh, nobody's being added to CSRS, the old system before 1985. Uh, the problem is most people who are coming out uh, into retirement are from that system and that's where the unfunded liability is and that's where and we really aren't even addressing the question of changing the unfunded liability the over half a trillion dollars but the problem is that, again that monthly outflow from the treasury so uh, I have tried to come up with something that's equitable and and what I propose uh, does affect members of Congress. Most people don't realize that members of Congress also contribute 8 percent to the retirement as opposed to 7 percent for the uh, uh, average federal uh, uh, employee. Uh, what's your opinion of that uh, proposal? Well, I, I just, uh, you talked to me, mentioned this to me yesterday, and I saw uh, some comments about that in the paper, and I haven't had a chance to really look at it, but I uh, I, I realize that, that we've got some real problems here. What, what I am concerned about is, is the people in the 10 to 15 years that have stuck it out. You know, most people don't stay, but the ones that leave and, and the impact it would have on them, and I don't think I know enough about it, uh, Mr. Chairman, to really be able to comment on it. It's, uh, initially, I looked at it and I thought, well, it's certainly something we ought, we ought to think about. Well, but, but I have a great concern when they have made all their financial plans based on the amount of money they think they're going to get and the amount of money they're paying out. And uh, today, one of the great frustrations in this country, in my estimation, is two people in the family have to work. And they're, they're so far away from their work. 
And when you increase their contribution, of course, obviously that takes away. And the other thing is, if, it depends on what we're doing it for. The other day we had a vote in, in the Appropriation Committee that said we're doing it for tax reduction rather than for deficit reduction. I, I am very concerned if we're increasing the, the requirements for federal employees just for tax reduction. Now, I don't think we can pass or a, a budget can be passed that includes tax reduction. I personally feel very strongly about it. Some of these cuts certainly have to be made. The public has spoken very clearly, but not for tax reduction. So I think it depends on the overall context what we're trying to solve here. Well, I thank you for your comments. I think you've also pointed out two things, that there aren't thousands of uh, former members of Congress that uh, are participating. It is less than 400. Secondly, that there are some differences. Uh, some brought about COLAs, and you have uh, addressed uh, the, the problem of how the COLA inflates them. The other thing that most folks don't realize, and I've learned also, is that former members and folks who participated in CSRS, the old system, did not uh, necessarily participate in Social Security. So they are getting actually uh, a larger amount uh, uh, of compensation uh, now in retirement. But I appreciate, again, your testimony and comments. I'd like to uh, yield at this time, if I may, to the ranking uh, uh, member of our full committee, Mrs. Collins. Mr. Murtha, the federal retirement system recognizes differences in the nature of the work that's performed by personnel in very demanding occupations like law enforcement officers and firefighters and air traffic controllers. And they all have higher accrual rates and lower age and length of service requirements than general uh, federal employees. Congressional staff are in a very demanding occupation too, as you've already said. They work extraordinarily long hours. They have very high levels of responsibility, and the strain they often endure, I believe, is comparable to these jobs. So doesn't it just provide a solid justification for the special retirement benefits that they receive now? Yeah, I, I feel very strongly, and, and, and I defend, uh, there's a lot of criticism of, of public employees, but I defend people who work for the legislature all the time. You know, you've got excesses, you've got people that, that don't work, but uh, I've never met a finer group of people than the ones that work for members of Congress uh, in the committees or on the professional staff or on the, the legislative staffs. Uh, uh, there's no one can work for a member, and I think the time shows. The fact that they only stay less than three years shows the tremendous demand, and any person that's willing to make that sacrifice to stay on longer certainly deserves special consideration. So I, I, I would defend the, the 1.7 is something front-loaded. Now, now, you remember what I said. It's 1.7 until 20 years, and then it goes down to 1. And uh, certainly that's, that's uh, to me, a fair way to handle it. When we looked at it eight years ago, uh, we thought uh, this was a legitimate way to handle it. I look upon a, a, um, the, uh, the dropping of a federal benefit and the, and the increase of an age as a tax on federal employees. It just seems to me that that's an extra burden that they shouldn't have to have. And especially if that tax benefit is, uh, or, or, or deficit uh, is going to go, the tax benefit would be to, say, people who have uh, stocks and bonds and capital gains tax decreases. And I don't think it's fair. Now, somebody used the word public servant uh, in a discussion around here, and it, it bothered me because a servant is one, as I understand it, who works for no pay at all. Now, it seems that we're trying to reach that point when it comes down to diminishing the retirement benefits of the federal employees who already don't get the, the ways that might be comparable in, pub, in, uh, in, in, in the private industry. So I have some real problems with that sort of thing, and I just wonder what your thoughts were about a tax, uh, what I call a tax, which is really a, a, high, a raising of the age, a lowering of the benefit in retirement. To me, that's a tax. Do you agree with that? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I do think all of us are going to have to make some sacrifice, but the gentlewoman is absolutely right. Uh, and I think if it goes for tax reduction, then it, it's a real mistake. I think exactly. that for us, uh, in, in my estimation, if, if we're going to increase 
uh, uh, or decrease benefits for federal employees and then reduce taxes for the, for, for the wealthy sector of the country, that's, that's a mistake and I would disagree with that. And I would hope that this, this all this euphoria, and I know the President and the leader, the Speaker and our leader are all for the tax cut. But I don't see how we do it uh, and get the deficit down. We went through that for six or eight years and it didn't work. Our, our, our deficit uh, substantially increased. So I hope that we're able to work that out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, I thank the gentlelady and yield now to the uh, Chairman of the full committee, Mr. Klinger. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to thank uh, my good colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murtha, for his longtime interest and involvement and leadership really in this whole question of federal retirement programs and I, I want to particularly recognize the outstanding work you did uh, when this issue was last being considered back in 84, 85 and 86. So I think uh, we are all aware of your uh, long involvement and great expertise in, in this area. And I think the other thing that uh, your presence uh, here today indicates too is that anything of this uh, sort, anything where we're looking at, at retirements uh, programs for either members or for the federal workforce. It has to be done in a bipartisan way. It can't be done on a partisan way. And so we welcome your involvement in the process and welcome your contributions and look forward to working with you as we, as we um, grope our way forward in this area. But uh, you've made a very valuable contribution already, and we, we're grateful for that. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate those comments, and I appreciate the work that you've done, and, the, and we've always approached things in a bipartisan manner, and I think that's the reason we've gotten so much done over the years. But this issue certainly has to be approached very carefully and in a bipartisan manner. And uh, I just, uh, I know that, that the federal employees and the members, uh, the, uh, the people that work for the legislature will be treated fairly by the subcommittee and by the, by the full committee when the time comes. And I think that's a key because they make so many sacrifices and they work such long hours and are so dedicated to public service. And most of them just can't afford to stay. So I think it's absolutely essential that we, we do the best we can by it. Thank you very much, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I thank you and would yield now to Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Murtha, I appreciate that you're sharing your uh, experience and perspective on this issue because you have studied it for a great deal of time and you're a resource that this subcommittee greatly needs on this issue, but also in the area of appropriations. Uh, having been an appropriator for many years, um, you are very much aware of the difference between budget authority and outlays and obligations. What seems to be driving this, at least allegedly, is that there's a $19 billion outflow annually, as the chairman said, uh, to cover the uh, federal government's contribution to this CSRS plan that has to be uh, to provide money to be paid out in the future. But this $19 billion is budget authority only. It is not outlays. It is an intergovernmental fund transfer. It stays within the government. It isn't, it's, it's not outlaid. Uh, and in fact, uh, as CSRS declines and FERS increases, what is more important is that the total amount of money being put into the government's funds, retirement funds, is $62.2 billion a year compared to $36 billion that is being paid out to retirees. Now, if we were to eliminate this $19 billion in budget authority, it wouldn't have any impact on the deficit, would it? Because the deficit is an outlay deficit. It doesn't affect the total amount of money going out of the federal government one iota. And, and so uh, uh, all we've done is to uh, create outlays, allegedly to address a budget authority, which wasn't in any way impacting the, uh, the deficit. So, uh, given your experience with, uh, with appropriations and the difference between budget authority and outlays, would you care to comment on that? Well, of course, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Bill Young and I handle the largest uh, discretionary money in the entire budget, uh, $252 uh, billion. And we wrestle continually with 
the impact of outlays versus the impact of budget authority and, and very concerned about balancing them out. In the end, uh, what really counts is the outlays. And we, we have a very low outlay, late, uh, outlay, outlay level for procurement, 10% a year, versus uh, uh, outlays in, in personnel, which is 100%. So we balance it very carefully, and, and I don't know enough about the, uh, uh, this particular, this, this proposal to know, but if what you say is true, obviously it has no impact on deficit at all. We have that problem all the time, trying to, to decide what does have an impact on reducing. And we've reduced the, the request by the government, uh, by the, the executive branch over the years by $55 billion, and that's actually an outlay not budget authorities, and, and we had to attack both. So I, I would say that uh, if, as you present it as accurate, then it would have no impact on the budget at all. Yeah. And and that's, that's a point that has to be emphasized. Uh, this $19 billion is purely budget authority, is not outlay. But the other point I want to uh, mention to and have you respond to is that while this discussion has focused on us, the members, it's really not about us, the members. It's about our wives and children. People who generally, if they're lucky, see us for a day and a half a week. Uh, many members, that's uh, rather than weekly, monthly visits. Uh, and we don't spend much of our salary. Our money goes to the family. Uh, we're up here all the time. Uh, and, and don't spend much more than, uh, than the money it costs for, uh, to pick up a sandwich in the member's cloakroom. Uh, but what we're really talking here about when we talk about member's retirement pension is what are we going to do to provide the security for our wife and kids uh, when we're no longer around. And that's why I was so struck by the point you made that of all the tens of thousands of people that have served in this Congress, I don't know how many thousands it is in total, there are only 381 living. Uh, They're drawing retirement. On retirement, yeah. living on retirement, that have actually served long enough to be vested yeah. and, and are still alive. And it's only $15 million when you talk about 430, 535 uh, members a year. That's, that's a rel much smaller amount of money than you would, uh, you would expect. Uh, and so the issue really is how are we, whether we are going to provide uh, an adequate, a decent uh, standard of living for our families given the sacrifice we expect them to make, which is a heck of a lot greater and even federal employees, as, as, uh, as strong an advocate as I am for the quality of the professional workforce, federal employees live with their families, and most of the members here don't. Uh, the gentleman uh, would yield for a yeah. moment. I just want to point out and uh, underline his statement that there are husbands who are spouses too. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm, excuse me. I'm, I'm talking to Mr. Murtha, but, uh, and here Mrs. Collins was beside me, Mrs. Morell on the left. Spouses is the operable word, and that was a terribly politically incorrect. And nobody works use. harder than Mrs. Morello, that's for no, sure. But it's our, that's for sure. Uh, but it's our spouses and children that we're really talking about in terms of the retirement plan. And if the gentleman to yield, and, uh, well, I, I would like to yield for, totally for to years, you. Until the for years, of my time. I've been a hero to spouses. The members don't like to admit <laughs> that they need additional benefits, but. Uh, uh, I, I've always been up here advocating a quality of life for, for the spouses and, and for the members themselves. And with all the health problems and everything, which Mr. Moran is certainly aware of, and all the difficulties the families face, all of them, we certainly want to be very, very careful that we don't do something that would jeopardize the quality of life of the person who's left after uh, the member's gone. And so I. Uh, I feel very strongly that we just have to be cautious in what we do and don't discourage people and don't make it worse than it is. Yeah, I think it's easy for members to be cavalier about retirement security and so on for themselves. And if it were only us, I think all of us could afford yeah. to be. But it's not us we're talking about individually. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentleman and yield now to Mr. Bass. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Congressman Murtha, I certainly appreciate your objectivity. And, and on, the, on the one hand, uh, as, you, as Mr. Moran has stated, we put in a lot of time. We work long hours. To some extent, we lack job security. Uh, however, I would also like to observe, if I might, that the average pay of, uh, of people who work in this society is probably less than a third of what we receive. The vast majority of the people in this country receive no pension at all. I have no pension program at all, nothing. And I would suggest that most employees in this country don't know, many employees in this country don't know whether they're going to be working on Monday, let alone have a, a job that's guaranteed as our job is until January of 1997. I could get up right now and walk out of this room and never show my face in Washington and I'd be guaranteed a pay until 1997. But you wouldn't be after 97. Boy, you bet. I, I don't think so unless I, <laughs> I, I would suggest that you're correct there. So uh, I, I would suggest, Mr. Murtha, that perhaps although your observations are of great merit and I applaud you for making them, that there are two sides to this, to this argument and that's precisely why this committee is investigating this issue today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Masker, did you have uh, questions? That's my friend down there, and for whom I have the greatest respect and admiration. And I want to thank you, Jack, for appearing here today before the committee. Uh, I, uh, uh, Jack probably knows, I served as a county commissioner for 15 years, and I served as chairman of the Washington County, Pennsylvania Employees Retirement System. And when I left on December 31st of 1994, the pension fund was funded at 107 percent. We had an actuary who did annual actuarial assumptions uh, for our pension plan. Uh, whatever happened to Parissa? I know what happened to Arissa, but I wonder what happened to Parissa where there were some guarantees uh, of uh, a system and how that system operated. And that if we're talking about employees paying more into the pension fund, could we uh, target that uh, for uh, the plan itself to make sure whatever that, that figure is, because I'm not sure what that figure is, and I would like to see uh, an actuary hired to tell me as a member of Congress and the other members of Congress what kind of shape this, this, these pension plans are in, whether it be the civil service or the FERS. Uh, and since you've also uh, very capably pointed out, uh, along with Mr. Moran, the difference of, of outlays, what, what does all this mean? I mean, is this sleight of hand? Is this, uh, uh, are, are we uh, playing with figures here? I, I'm not sure, Jack. I just wonder whether you'd well, share. It, 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 obviously, the private pension plans, we've got some real problems with a lot of private pension plans. And, and uh, we continually battle how much more should be put in. And of course, most private employers uh, pay all the pension funds, and, and most employees don't pay anything into their own pension plan, uh, uh, the majority of them. But, but uh, uh, we got some real problems, and we keep working on trying to guarantee the pension plans that are in place. I remember when it passed, we were concerned about small corporations, <clears throat> and we were concerned about uh, people who worked in garment factories that lost their benefits. And uh, of course, it turned out that an awful lot of big corporations and people who work for big corporations benefited because of the legislation that we passed, and it guaranteed their pension. And so it's, it's a very complicated thing, and, and, and we worked on years and years trying to pass that legislation, and we didn't solve the problem by far because we still have underfunded pension plans. But when we developed this pension plan, we felt it was actuarially sound, and it reduced the problem that we had, and over half the people that are uh, in the pension plan now, the three million, including the postal workers, of the three million people working in the system, over half are already in, or just about half are already in, in the new pension plan. So, uh, you know, we've made progress, and we've moved towards an actuarially sound. What I'm saying is, I'm just concerned that we do something that would disrupt this very delicate balance that we have, and, and it's one thing to do it for uh, deficit reduction, but to do it for tax decrease, uh, I would not be in favor of. 
Well, then perhaps we could direct that any uh, new deductions from employees or members of Congress go specifically to the pension plan and be a part of the overall pension plan. That's I mean, what we're doing. I said earlier this week that one, we found money to bail out the savings and loan. Uh, we're involved in the pension guarantee corporation. I'm not sure whether that's the, the correct term or not, where it participates with the private sector, yet we're about to turn our back on people who have uh, served this country. I conclude my remarks, Mr. Chairman. I thank you and uh, yield now to the gentle lady from uh, Maryland, Ms. Thank you. Morella. Thanks, Mr. Murtha. Uh, it's always good to have the benefit of your experience. Um, I wanted to just pick up on what you talked about in terms of if we're looking for savings, maybe a kind of a flat diet cola would be the way to go. Um, do you mean everybody would get the same cola or would it be something where if you are at, at the bottom of the scale looking beyond congressional members that you would get a percentage up to a certain point? Yeah, well my recommendation originally was that everybody would get a flat cola and not necessarily based on the lowest level of the pension but but uh, based on CPI at some level. And I think that's something the committee would have to work out. I've had a hard time selling this. I talked to uh, Mr. Panetta about it, and he liked the idea. Of course, he's a former chairman of the Budget Committee, and uh, he knows the problem we have with the deficit. I talked to Alice Rivlin, though. She was very nervous about it, didn't even want to hear about it. I've, I've tried to get figures to see what kind of money it would mean and what kind of an impact it would have, and I haven't gotten those yet. But I. I would challenge the committee to look into it and make a recommendation. I think there could be a lot of savings. And what I'm suggesting is that the people at the higher level, and I know they have a higher standard of living, but, but I just think it's unfair to keep pushing them out, uh, getting the percentage increase rather than a flat increase, which would take care of their cost of living increases. I understand that, and I've always kind of felt similarly yeah. that when you reach the top and you continue to get a percentage, you continue to escalate, yeah. whereas that person yeah. at a lower grade just never can can appreciate yeah. uh, uh, really that kind of what the COLA was intended yeah. for. Uh, also, uh, what about military retirees? Would you like to, because you're very expertise, make any yeah. comments for the record on that? Yeah, we, we have uh, had a number of proposals about military retirees and, and a number of changes in the system over the years. Matter of fact, uh, I think in the last 10 years we've probably changed it uh, three times, uh, reduced the benefits. As you know, last year, unfortunately, we, we delayed the uh, COLA for the military retirees by 27 months. And yet the civilian retired, now this is active duty retirees, and civilian employees are only, re only delayed by nine months. But this is what we get into, we're trying to save money. Uh, we put the money in for that, and it was a large amount of money, and, and uh, it will continue to be a large amount of money. Uh, the, the amount of money we're involved in here when it comes to active duty pay and pensions is staggering. And of course, every year in the military pensions, we set aside enough money to pay for it every year. But of course down the road it's going to be a big expense. So we've changed it continually. One of the things they recommended in the Carter administration was people stay longer and retire after 22, 23 years rather than 20, which saved us a lot of money. But they didn't uh, endorse it because it didn't have any upfront savings. So I think we have to look mm -hmm. at both. And I think when we looked at our pension plan here, meaning not only the members but all the 19,000 people work for the legislature, uh, we, we recognize it had to be a long-term solution to it, and our recommendations were that it be actuarially sound after an extended period of time, and I think we've done that. And my concern is we, we would move too fast, and people who have planned very carefully for their retirement wouldn't have that money available to them, or people, when you increase the amount they have to pay, would have less money available to them, if it's for I realize all of us have to make sacrifice, but if it's for a tax cut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. And again, I guess you're pointing out also the need for equity when you're looking at your yeah, military yeah. retirees as well as your civil servants. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I thank the uh, gentlelady. And I also want to take this opportunity to sincerely say thank you, Mr. Murtha, for 
sharing this time and your valuable insight, uh, the historical uh, perspective uh, and legislative uh, history of this issue with the, our subcommittee. We look forward to working with you, and I do pledge to you to work in a fair and equitable uh, fashion. Thank you so much, and we'll excuse you at this Thank time. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, chair will now call uh, the following witnesses, uh, remainder of the witnesses that are here. Mr. Shays we have, Mr. Chrysler. We have any other members of the panel remain? Yes. Okay, we've got Mr. Salmon and Mr. Stockman and Mr. English. I think we have the balance of the panelists. I want to uh, welcome all of our uh, remaining uh, panelists uh, and thank you for your patience. As soon as we get the names out here, we'll begin. I would like to uh, begin the uh, uh, testimony with Mr. Shays, a senior, uh, one of our senior members. I see we have a number of freshman panelists. Uh, but Mr. Shays, uh, you're recognized uh, to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me express uh, gratitude to you and to your committee for uh, taking up this issue. It's extraordinarily important. And I just uh, appreciate all the hard work that each and every one of you put in. And I just want uh, your ranking member, Mr. Moran, to know that um, uh, the members of this uh, body are very grateful for all your hard work and the fact that you spend so much time here given the personal challenges you have at home. You have a tremendous amount of respect in this institution. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm here to make two very basic points on behalf of a bipartisan reform team comprised of David Mingy, Jay Dickey, Nathan Deal, Enid Walholtz, Tom Barrett, Scott Klug, Paul McHale, Michael Castle, and myself. Uh, we've put forward a number of reform proposals that deal with a variety of issues, campaign finance reform, gift ban, uh, lobbying reform, and so on. And one of them, our reforms, is to get our pension system to conform exactly and precisely to the way it exists for other federal employees. Not to have any better system or any worse system than exists for any other employees. We have two basic systems. We have CSRS and we have FERS. CSRS was ultimately limited uh, because it was deemed to be a very generous system that would bankrupt uh, the system. Federal employees were then given the option, new ones, and I'm under the new system to be under FERS. Uh, one uh, pays a far more generous program. If you are a member of Congress, you can get 2.5% for every year of service. If you've been in just 10 years, when you retire, you can get 25% of your pension. <coughs> Uh, those of us who came under FERS get 1.7 percent, but we do have, uh, like other federal employees, a thrift savings plan. If we're in 10 years, we get 17 percent. Uh, I kept telling people uh, in my district that we were treated like any other federal employee, and I believe that to be the case. I thought when we went from CSRS to FERS that those under FERS were in fact treated like any other federal employee. So it was a bit of a shock for me when I really delved into it to realize that federal employees get 1% for every year that they work under FERS. Well, if that's the case for federal employees, that's what it should be for members of Congress. And if under CSRS, federal employees get 2%, but members of Congress get 2.5%, then we should be 2%. So the first point I make to you is that whatever it is for federal employees under CSRS or FERS, Members of Congress should be under the very same system. So I would agree with those who say, let's change the system to conform. I would disagree, however, with some members who have come and said we shouldn't have uh, the same pension that other federal employees, or that we should have no pension. We should have, as federal employees, the same. Now, the next issue is an issue that I think you, Mr. Mike, are trying to address. And that is the question, are federal employees given a benefits that are better than those in the private sector? Uh, are they given more credit each year than in the private sector? Are they paying as much of a contribution uh, to the retirement system that other, federal em that other people in the private sector would pay? And if we determine uh, that the answer is yes, we as federal employees are given a better system, then I think that we have to conform to what exists in the private sector. So for instance, if we are allowed to take the 
the three highest years uh, to define our, our salary level and then which we take uh, uh, through a formula the number of years we've worked. Uh, if, if, federal, uh, if in the private sector it's more closer to a, to a five year, they take the last five years or the highest five years, then I think we should as well. I notice, Mr. Micah, that you suggest that we do that in your bill. And I would just say to you that if ultimately we determine, or this committee uh, determines <coughs> that that's the case, then I think we should, should conform to the private sector. The question is, though, how quickly should we get there? Should it take three years to get there? Should it take four years? Should it take five years? I do have some sympathy for a federal employee who's about to retire, who then finds that um, uh, his, uh, he's going to be under a different system and would be uh, receiving significantly reduced uh, benefits. So you might phase in that uh, over a longer period of time. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I've concluded my comment. I just uh, want to emphasize again, whatever we pr put on the private sector, uh, the federal employees, members of Congress should be the same. And uh, my group, uh, the group that I'm working with, would oppose strongly any effort to maintain members of congressmen's pensions uh, different or better than anyone else in, in, the, in the federal system. Mr. Shays, we thank you for your uh, participation and for your testimony. And we had also heard earlier from Mr. Mengi, we uh, also thank uh, you for working in a bipartisan fashion to bring your recommendations uh, to our subcommittee. At this time, I'd like to yield now to Mr. You, Mr. Steve, Steve Stockman from Texas uh, for his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to tell you that uh, I have another pressing engagement, so we're going to slip out right after this. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, inviting us here today and in, in your uh, fact that you're moving on this so quickly. And ironically, the gentleman I ran against, I just noticed, is, is on the wall here. <laughs> and uh, I noticed also one of the things when I was looking at his pension, I was quite surprised that he's uh, projected, as you know from my testimony, to receive almost $2 million, and that's pretty good uh, funds, and that's one of the reasons why I came here today was to express concern over our uh, pensions, and, and I'd like to abbreviate my comments and submit my testimony, the unanimous consent that it be in the record. Without objection. Uh, what I, I believe is that uh, we, we currently are in a, uh, in a state in which many of us here are being looked upon it in a microscope. And we're, we're asking the people of America to take drastic cuts. And it's my belief that without the, uh, for us to do similar, then we're setting ourselves up for, I think, trouble in the f next fall, quite frankly. And there's an old saying that says, good, good policy is good politics. And I think it's good uh, policy to set us on equal footing or a little below what, what the public is. We, we forget that we are uh, servants of the public and we work for the people. And uh, last time I checked, I heard some of the testimony here today and about the long, grueling hours. And, and uh, I, I grant that we do work long, grueling hours. But I have to say many in, in our district uh, work long, grueling hours. And we're working uh, five, seven days a week. That's true. But on the other hand, so are a lot of other people. And yet they aren't put above. Uh, us and we are servants of the people and it's my belief that uh, pension reform sends not only a uh, signal to America but it also sets a precedent which which I would hope would be taken up by the rest of the federal government uh, before we uh, can get the, 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 the stone out of someone else's eye we need to get the stick out of ours and uh, Mr. Chairman I, I commend you for the work that you have done and, and please that uh, you allowed us the opportunity to express our opinions, and, and thank you for uh, your, your input. Well, I thank you for your contribution and the <coughs> sincerity of uh, your comments uh, today and the fresh new perspective that each of these uh, new members bring to, to Congress. So uh, if you do have to leave, uh, we uh, realize, uh, again, your pressing schedule. And I'd like to defer now to Mr. Uh, Dick Chrysler for, uh, for his testimony. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of this subcommittee. Uh, I uh, happen to be one of those uh, 45 uh, members on that list uh, that did make that, that millionaire category, I guess. I'm, matter of fact, I'm number 14. But I am glad to live and proud to live in a country 
where you can come up with an idea and you can create jobs and you can put people to work and you can create wealth and that's why I'm here in Congress is to be able to create that kind of an opportunity for my children and your children and their grandchildren in this country. And last November, my freshman colleagues and I arrived in Washington on a mandate of reform that was generated by the American people's frustration with our federal government. In 1994, <coughs> the elections throughout the country dramatically altered the makeup of the House of Representatives. For the first time in history, the voters sent more business people to Congress than any other profession, and quite frankly, it was about time. In reference to Ronald Reagan's line, that the worst thing an American business person could ever encounter was to open his or her door and to find someone saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. We have ultimately arrived to Congress to declare we are from the business community, so let's get down to business. Some of those with business backgrounds have a unique perspective to bring to Washington. We do not study business, we conduct it. We understand the relation between investment, productivity, quality, and profit. To us, it is obvious that we need to re redefine how our government manages itself to the point that where we feel the federal government needs to operate much more like a business. It is the largest business in the world, bar none. Which leads me today to today's discussion, federal pensions. As members of the new majority, we promised to reform ourselves before we made, our, made other long overdue sacrifices in the federal government. And that's why I was privileged to introduce the first bill in the contract with America, the one that cut congressional staffs and congressional committees by one third. And I felt it was important because it is leadership by example. We have to be willing to cut ourselves before we can ask any other branch of government to make the same sacrifices. And when Congress starts to make tough decisions on those budget cuts, one element cannot be omitted. The element is the enormous burden federal employees' pensions place on the budgeting process. Additionally, we need to judge whether they merit the benefits that provide in relation to the current private sector equivalents that millions of American taxpayers rely upon for retirement. The old adage that there is no better job than a government job has become riddled with truth among the American people. The American public know that federal workers have more generous retirement packages than that of the average American worker. Currently, my staff is in the process of evaluating the benefits, the pension benefits, of 50 of the Fortune 500 companies. And to address an earlier question uh, by Mr. Moran and, and, and looking at this sample, an average was taken with the assumption an employee has worked for a company for 15 years starting at a salary of $27,220, retiring at the age 65 with a final an annual salary of $57,600. Using this data, the average annual retirement benefit would be $11,318. Using the Federal Employment retire Retirement System's pension formula of the average high three-year salary multiplied by the number of years in service multiplied, multiplied by FEERS accrual rate of 1.7 percent and the assumption a high three-year average salary would be $52,000. The retirement benefits under FEERA would be $13,260. That is a difference of almost $2,000 without taking into account the annual COLAS federal employees in, that they enjoy yearly. And we do not need to look too far to see how federal COLAs greatly benefit federal pensions. As members of Congress, we currently enjoy these yearly adjustments while millions of Americans who incidentally pay our salaries do not. Former Representative Hastings Keith, a Republican from Massachusetts, now co-chairman of the National Committee on Public Employee Pensions, has given a clear example of the way the members' pension rates have dramatically increased. In 1973, he retired at age 58 after having served 14 years in Congress 
and received $18,720 annually in federal pension benefits. Since then, with the advantage, advantage of COLA, the benefits have swollen to $71,928 in 1994. I am not saying we should eliminate or haphazardly slash the present government pension program. However, we need to look at new ideas. I believe that ideas have consequences. We need to have a pension program that pays us no more or no less than what the private sector is being paid. We understand why the pension program is the way it is, why it was re reformed in 1983, and we need to evaluate the programs we now have in conjunction with the existing thrift savings plan, the federal workers equivalent of a 401k program. Federal employees under the thrift savings plan can now contribute up to 10 percent of their pre-tax wages into the plan. The federal government matches dollar for dollar the first 3 percent and the next 2 percent is matched at 50 percent. The government also contributes 1 percent of compensation to all federal employees eligible for retired benefits regardless of their participation in the thrift savings plan. Federal employees are fully vested after five years of service. Twice a year during open season, employees can change their contribution rate and the percentage of the funds that they have invested. According to the CBO, the federal government will pay pensions totaling nearly $66 billion to almost 2.5 million retired civilian workers in fiscal year 1994 alone. Under the current fiscal constraints our federal government faces, and we are broke, a continued trend in such expenditures <coughs> places not only the future of federal retirees in jeopardy, but the American taxpayer as well. According to the Office of Personnel Management, the federal government spends 25 percent of payroll expenditures on pensions. Despite the 1983 law intended to reform federal pensions, the OPM expects that amount to grow to 40 percent by the year 2020. At this rate, our country will arrive at a pension disaster. Public pensions unfunded liability for the federal pension plan has reached the level of $1.5 trillion. The federal government funds federal pensions on a pay-as-you-go basis. If the federal government would have to account for their pensions the same way we did in private industry, the U.S. debt would increase a staggering 32 percent overnight, from $4.7 trillion to $6.2 trillion. As I said before, I am not advocating the elimination of federal pensions, and no matter what changes are made, every, every federal employee who presently participates in a federal pension program will, should be and will be grandfathered into that plan. However, if we do not make some form of modifications, this pension system will collapse like a house of cards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman and also for the uh, business perspective uh, he brings to Congress and the panel. And I'd like to call now on uh, Representative Phil English uh, from Pennsylvania for his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the entire panel for the opportunity to testify today on this important issue. I'm here today to testify in support of H.R. 804, the Congressional Members' Pension Limitation Act of 1995, offered by my distinguished colleague, Representative Miller of Florida, and of which I'm a co-sponsor. It's a bill to restore fairness to the manner in which we calculate congressional pensions. Mr. Chairman, the American people can see no reason why members of Congress should receive a more generous pension than other federal employees, and in my view, the American people are right. Over the course of the last several months, we've made tremendous strides in our drive to reform Congress and change the way Washington works. We've opened committee meetings to the public and press, slashed the size of our staffs, and made Congress abide by its own laws. And it's no wonder that approval ratings for Congress have finally reversed a decade-long decline and begun heading upward again. That does not mean that our work is finished far from it. In my town meetings, in letters to the editor, and in phone calls and letters from home, 
My constituents continue to be angered by the prospect of their elected officials receiving six-figure pensions, pensions far more generous than those available to other federal employees. The bill introduced by Representative Miller corrects not only the problem of pension inequality, but simultaneously advances several other important public policy goals. First, H.R. 804 guarantees that congressional pensions return to a more equitable level. Second, it promotes a citizen legislature by removing the financial incentive for members to serve more than a dozen years. And third, the bill makes it clear that this Congress has the guts to clean its own house, even when, it is clean, when clean, that cleaning means cutting our own pensions. Under the Miller plan, members of Congress would continue to be eligible for Social Security, but the other two elements of our pension plans would be carefully limited. The bill eliminates government contributions to members' thrift savings plan after a member has served 12 years in Congress, and importantly, the pension benefit for members is abolished. The plan effectively converts pensions into a 401k style account. Under this plan, no congressman would leave with a retirement fund that pays more than roughly $34,000 per year, a dramatic change from recent history. I think it is also important to note that our plan appropriately deals with the issue of previously elected members who haven't yet vested a pension. The plan freezes contributions to non-vested members' accounts after five years. In that way, the Miller proposal avoids the need to reimburse members who have already contributed to the system prior to vesting. It's a simple and cost-effective solution to a potentially difficult issue. As I noted earlier, Mr. Chairman, I support this bill not just because it reforms our pensions, but because H.R. 804 advances other important goals. One of the dangers I perceive with the present system is that it gives elected officials a large financial reward for pursuing long careers with direct consequences for public policy. Rewarding incumbency should not have to fall on the taxpayer's shoulders. Rather, by removing the financial incentive for staying in Congress more than 12 years, we have the chance to remove a powerful disincentive to the creation of a citizen legislature. Since term limits are one of the key planks in the contract with America, I believe that this reform complements the contract both in spirit and substance. In an age when we're asking the public to sacrifice on very difficult budget cuts, we can't at the same time ask them to finance gold-plated pensions for members of Congress. Adoption of the Congressional Accountability Act was a great first step. Now we need to finish the job and ensure that a skeptical public won't wonder why we didn't apply the same principles to our pensions. In sum, Mr. Chairman, I believe this bill is the right thing to do, and this is the right time to do it. And thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. And I thank you for your testimony. I think we have uh, five minutes, Mr. Solomon. If you don't mind, we'll have enough time to get, could you, uh, to get your testimony. Would you like to go ahead? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank I you. would. And let me just state for the record that um, I am not a self-made millionaire. Uh, I'm a person that uh, has a family of four children and I'm struggling just like many Americans out there just to try to make ends meet from one paycheck to another paycheck. I don't have any real uh, uh, outlandish desires for my family. I just like to make sure that they get a good education. But I didn't come to Congress to collect on a pension. I came to Congress to serve and to try to do the right thing. I didn't come to <coughs> Congressman to become a career politician. I came here again, I believe, to be a servant. I appreciate you holding this important hearing today. This is a very important issue to the American public. It's important to our colleagues. It's important to our constituents. I'm here to speak on behalf of Mr. Miller's bill because I believe that it is a compromise that forges the best solution uh, that could be possible. And I'm here to testify on its behalf. I'm not here to, this morning to impugn the institution of Congress. That is not the intent of Mr. Miller's bill. And that is not the purpose of this morning's hearing. Rather, I'd like to take this opportunity to explain why we need this legislation and why it needs to be a key component of a broader congressional reform movement. The American people sent a clear message to Congress last November. Congress had to stay in touch with its constituents, and they weren't, and the people were fed up. And the people, as we know, were right. Congress had exempted itself from many of the laws that it imposed on every American. Congress had not had to comply with the workplace safety laws environmental regulations, family and medical leave regulations, 
or any of the regulations stifling productivity and the growth in America's private sector. At the same time, Congress had continued to spend more than it was taking in, continued to raise taxes on the American people, and continued to increase the size of government. In short, Congress had become an island of denial in a sea of legislative reality. Congress had been failing the American people and rewarding itself for the effort. On the first day of the 104th Congress, we passed the Congressional Accountability Act to begin to reverse the course. We have also ordered an audit of the operations of the House, which will also help us to bridge the chasm that developed by forcing us to identify ways to streamline and modernize our operations, the very way the American businesses have been able to innovate, compete, and succeed in a very rapid changing marketplace. In this movement toward making Congress run like a business, we cannot ignore changes in the world of private pension systems. Within the American private sector, we have seen a dramatic shift toward defined contribution pension plans and away from defined benefit plans. For better or worse, this trend is a reality. In Congress, we are already have a defined contribution pension available to us, but we still rely heavily on a defined benefit plan. As American businesses have adapted, we too should learn to rely on a pension system that much more is representative of the American business environment and the American worker. This will not impede our ability to draft sound public policy, nor will it create a disincentive for quality individuals to seek office. What it will do, however, is make Congress look more like the nation that we represent. As I said earlier, the American people have sent a clear message that we must cut the cost of government and that we must get our house in order. Spending cuts are never easy to make. Every spending program has a constituency, and these groups are usually quite vocal, as we've seen over the last few weeks. They are quite naturally nervous about the effects that change will have on their interests. But facing a national debt of $5 trillion and growing, we owe it to our children to work tirelessly <coughs> to shrink our federal government. Again, private recipients of funding and federal employees will all be affected by the necessary belt tightening. Congress must show that we too are willing to make the personal sacrifices to work toward the greater good of, Ameri of the American people. Pension reform will show America that we recognize the enormity of this problem and that we will not insulate ourselves from its, from its solution as we have so many times in the past. Why pension reform? Congressmen and women are working harder and loyally serve a noble institution. However, members of Congress enjoy far more generous pension benefits than any other federal employees. While it is true that our jobs are different in nature for many federal employees, the comparison between pension plans certainly sheds some light on the need for reform. First of all, members' pensions accrue 70 percent faster annually than those of federal workers. Further, members of Congress become eligible for more benefits at an earlier age than other federal employees. For example, members will be eligible to receive 34 percent of their high three salary at age 50, while federal employees do not receive their 20 percent until age 60. Part of the reason for this disparity is the higher accrual rate used to calculate members' pensions. Members of Congress are for some reason afforded the same high accrual rate used for policemen and firefighters to comp compensate them for hazardous for the hazardous duty, the hazardous nature of their careers. Admittedly, I've not been in Congress for as long as many of my other colleagues, but as far as I can tell, running to the Capitol to cast a vote, as we have to right now, or fighting off lobbyists appears to be the most hazardous duty that we will ever have to perform. Congressional pensions were originally intended to serve as an enticement for members of Congress to retire. But what we've seen, it doesn't entice them to retire, it entices them to stay longer, and it encourages careerism. Congressional pensions must be reformed, but we cannot stop there. In order to return to a citizen legislature and visit it, which was envisioned by our founding fathers, we must move forward with franking reform, term limits, and campaign finance reform. Along with the already passed congressional accountability measures, these actions will truly move the incentives and built-in advantages of incumbency. We must get our House in order. We must share in the belt tightening, and that will be required to balance the budget. Congressman Miller's uh, pension bill is a sound first step in achieving this goal. I wholeheartedly support this proposal. I urge my colleagues to support it as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. And also, uh, I would request that my uh, statement be included in the record without objection. Without objection, uh, so ordered. Uh, I do want to thank all of our panelists, the freshman panelists uh, that have remained and given their testimony, your insight. Uh, uh, and again, your, your fresh uh, perspective uh, to this issue. Uh, we do have a vote on. Uh, I, w I will excuse the panel. Uh, 
and uh, ask you if you have additional comments to submit them for the record. And we will reconvene at 12 o'clock and take the uh, third panel, which will be our final panel. Thank you. If I could have your attention, please, we would like to uh, uh, to call the meeting back to order of, this, of our subcommittee and uh, call forward our third panel and our final panel, uh, Nancy Kingsbury, Director of Federal Human Resource Management Issues, Government Accounting Office, and uh, Mr. Jack Stair, uh, Mr. Stair's Chairman of the Committee on Employee Benefits of the Financial Executive Institute uh, from the private sector. We appreciate so much your patience and uh, uh, with the uh, votes that have occurred, uh, uh, your uh, understanding and the, and the delay in the process here. It's also customary uh, for non-members of Congress, uh, since this is an investigations and oversight uh, uh, subcommittee, uh, to swear in our witnesses. So if you don't mind, would you stand? <clears throat> Raise your right hand and do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And with that, I'd like to first call on uh, Nancy Kingsbury uh, for her <clears throat> testimony. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and your patience in hanging in until the bitter end of this uh, discussion this morning. Um, I would suggest that my statement be entered into the record, and I will try to be as brief as I can. Without uh, objection, so ordered. A lot of the uh, specific facts that we present in our testimony have been touched on this morning, uh, and I'd like to emphasize in the uh, oral statement a couple of specific things just for clarification. Uh, with respect to the portion of our testimony about uh, the benefits currently given to members of Congress, I think it's important to recognize under FERS that members get essentially the same benefits as several other groups of federal employees, namely law enforcement officers and air traffic controllers and the like. Um, they have slightly different um, years of service requirements. Uh, than those groups, but their benefit accruals are essentially the same as those groups, and uh, I just wanted to get clarify that for the record. And then we were asked in preparation for this testimony uh, to revisit some of our work um, that we did in the run-up to the creation of FERS about private sector pension plans, and I just want to highlight a few things uh, for the debate this morning. Uh, we are in the middle of updating that work. We have looked at some additional current studies uh, beyond what we've done in the past, and generally find that the patterns, uh, while they're changing somewhat, are not vastly different from our earlier work. With respect to the issue of, of um, high three versus high five, uh, depending a little bit on which study you look at and whether you're looking at lar relatively larger firms or smaller firms, about half of the private uh, plans that are reported by these studies appear to require high five. Um, but in the larger ones, and the ones done 
uh, in, the, in the biggest corporations. Almost half of them also permit uh, retiring under high three. So I think that's something that we may want to look at with a little more specificity uh, as we move this debate ahead of time. It's been said several times this morning with respect to co uh, contributions that it's relatively rare in the private sector for employees to have to actually contribute to their pension plans. Um, in one recent study, which was of employees uh, done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, only about 97% about of the employees reported that they made no contributions to their, uh, to their pension plans at all. Uh, in another study, 88% of the plans covered required no contribution, and of the 12% that did require a contribution, it was on the order of 5 or 6%. Uh, of course, those private plans also do require Social Security, which does um, have a contribution portion. Finally, um, <clears throat> there has been a good bit of debate this morning with respect to uh, COLAs. And while it's true that most private sector plans do not provide regular periodic COLAs, um, many of them do provide ad hoc adjustments. And one study estimated uh, that for the larger plans, those ad hoc adjustments uh, had averaged close to 60% of the consumer price index over a period of a decade, uh, while the government program uh, for CSRS on paper requires 100% um, replacement of CPI. I think the practice has been something less than that, and one of your um, witnesses at the hearing last week suggested it was on the order of 80%. We have not actually looked at that uh, at this point in time. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that under FERS there is no coal at all until uh, age 62. One of the things we did in our earlier study um, to try to estimate the relative generosity, if you will, of federal uh, pension plans was to, to estimate the proportion of salary replaced by those pension plans in the private sector, uh, including with Social Security, which sometimes is left out of the debate. And what that analysis showed 10 years ago was that if you retire at age 55 with 30 years of service, and that level of retirement is not uncommon in the, pri in the private sector, uh, CSRS benefits were relatively more generous than private sector plans. That is to say, uh, they replaced 56% of pay compared to 46% of pay with private sector plans. However, if employees worked till age 62 with 30 years of service, and I would remind you that um, the current average retirement age in the federal government is almost age 62, private plans ended up replacing a greater amount of uh, salary than uh, CSRS did, and it was a, the difference between 70% and 56%. Now, I will acknowledge that this data is uh, somewhat old, and we are going to be looking at this again uh, more specifically as this debate plays out this spring. Um, so we're, we're, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer your questions when my uh, co-panelist is done. We thank you for your testimony, and now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Jack Stair. Thank you again for your patience. Uh, thank you for yours, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today and give you some feel for what's going on in the, in the private sector. Um, I am a senior consultant with DuPont Finance Function and chairman of the Financial Executive Institute's Committee on Employee Benefits, or CEB. And I want to thank you for inviting CEB to provide information on the private sector plans as your subcommittee examines the federal civil service retirement system. Financial Executives Institute is a professional association of senior financial officers with over 14,000 members from 8,500 companies. CEB is the Institute's policy-making committee on all benefits issues, and we look at benefit issues from a public policy, corporate, and especially financial perspective. And I'd like to share that perspective with you today and some observations about the Federal Civil Service Retirement System as it compares to those in the private sector, as well as some comments on trends we see developing in benefits in the private sector. The present federal system is a mixture of about 50% old system and 50% new system. Benefits under the old system, essentially before 1984, were high relative to industry plans. In recognition of that, Benefits were reduced after 1984 in the new system. However, 
as I will discuss shortly, I believe benefits continue to be high relative to industry plans. The three-tiered system composed of Social Security layer and a defined benefit or DB layer and a defined contribution or DC layer provides substantial benefits as well as additional opportunity for individuals to provide for their own retirement. Many companies do not offer both a DC plan and a DB plan. This combination is typical in larger companies such as DuPont. It is certainly not unusual for only one of the two plans to be offered in small and mid-sized companies. There are, in looking at it, four areas which distinguish the federal DB plan from private sector plans, which I wanted to point out today. First is that uh, employee contributions are required at 0.8% uh, of pay. It is very unusual to find any employee contributions in a defined benefit plan in the private sector. Another thing, the funding level is relatively low. Accrued liabilities far exceed plan assets. While most private sector plans are fully funded, Another point, the benefit accrual rates under the plan's terms are generous compared to those you'll find in industry. And last of all, the automatic cost of living adjustments, or, or the COLAs, at 100 percent of the consumer price index far exceed industry practices. DuPont recently concluded a study on COLAs. We found ourselves to be on the high side within a group of very competitive companies. And our practice has been to adjust on an ad hoc basis for about half of the CPI. Benefit levels in the def federal uh, defined contribution plan also seem high relative to those in industry. For example, a 1 percent contribution to all individuals' accounts is unusual. Most companies require at least some contribution from employees. The federal system has a relatively high matching percentage. It starts with one-to-one -one match and then goes down to 50 cents on the dollar. A flat 50 cents matching is more typical, particularly when both a DB and a DC plan are offered. The absence of any deferral percentage testing required by ERISA allows every employee to contribute up to 10 percent of pay. Uh, in the private sector, depending on the results of this test, uh, companies must limit contributions of the so-called highly compensated employees. Those highly compensated employees are defined to be employees earning over $66,000 in 1995. That number is uh, indexed with inflation. <coughs> Contributions can be limited, because of this test, to well below 10 percent of pay. In our case, roughly 6 percent of pay is the limit. Now for some trends. There seems to be movement toward placing more responsibility on the individual to get their jobs done. This philosophy is also reflected in companies being less paternalistic and acting more as facilitators for individuals to provide for their own needs. While this movement started with health care, it is also reflected in more DC type plans being newly adopted rather than DB type plans, as somebody mentioned earlier today. Some of the reasons for this may include the following. The, the fact that the DC benefits are more portable. They're more visible to younger participants and funds are accessible through loans or withdrawals whereas DB plans reward long-term service, which may create an artificial incentive to stay on with a company. COLAs become a moot issue, since benefits or account balances would automatically grow with time. Account balances continue to increase as employees work beyond age 65, while the value of a DB annuity would begin to decrease due to the shorter time over which the annuity would be paid. 
uh, compliance with ERISA and the Internal uh, Revenue Service uh, requirements. DC plans are simpler to administer and do not usually require complex actuarial valuations as the DB plans do. However, there are still reporting, disclosure, and other discrimination testing requirements which are a, step, a substantial burden to employers. In summary, it would seem that the benefits provided under the federal system are more generous compared to industry practice. They are not as well funded and they include costly automatic colas in excess of industry practice. These areas should be explored for significant cost savings. Also, funding of the federal system needs to be examined to ensure these pension promises can be met without overburdening taxpayers. Additional funds should be contributed. Investment management of the plan's assets should be reviewed as well for opportunities for improvement. Thank you for the opportunity to present our views, and I would be happy to respond to any questions. Well, again, I thank uh, both of our uh, witnesses, uh, both for their uh, uh, testimony and their patience. Uh, um, Ms. Uh, Kingsbury, we're going to uh, continue to rely on you to provide us with some data. We've heard uh, different uh, statistics and facts uh, bannered about here, some uh, uh, that uh, I think may be an error, but we're, we're relying on you to uh, hopefully provide our subcommittee with some accurate information on, uh, again, some of the fiscal impact and uh, uh, the, the real figures involved here. Um, it's my understanding that uh, uh, you st stated in your, and you stated in your um, testimony that the average age of retirement for, among federal employees is uh, 61 uh, years. Is that correct? It's 61.5. Uh -huh. It's between 61 and 62. Well, one of the concerns I've had and something that's motivated my action in this area um, is that uh, we are having more and more employees. Uh, they're going to advise us there will be no further votes, but <laughs> uh, one, one of uh, the things that has driven my uh, uh, particular interest and in action uh, is that uh, we are seeing the downsizing of federal government and while we won't see any more people come into the old retirement system, CSRS system, most of the people who will be retiring, if I interpret this correct, will come out of the old retirement system, CR, CSRS, because in fact uh, I think under what you've testified here today, uh, 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 there, there's no COLAs until 62, there's no real impact and most of these people uh, aren't el eligible for retirement because we've only had the FERS around for a short period of time. Is that a correct assumption? Uh, That's a correct assumption and FERS is essentially fully funded. Right. Uh, and the pressure is coming then from the other end on the CSRS uh, uh, and again we have this, uh, uh, this uh, monthly outflow and that's been again uh, sort of the preventive approach that I'm trying to take. If we in fact downsize the federal government by 12 and a half percent which the administration has recommended or 25 percent such as the <coughs> Senate has recommended, uh, most of those people that would be eligible in fact would come out of CSRS, uh, the old system. Would that be correct? If to the extent the downsizing is accomplished by retirements that's probably correct. Yes. Well, most people who would be eligible would only come out of that category, again, that's, because of the age of uh, FERS. Is that correct? That's correct, but it's not clear that some of the downsizing isn't going to require layoffs. I guess that's the only, uh -huh. and, and uh, layoffs would affect other this, people as well. Well, the, the first hearing that we had was uh, dealing with workforce reduction uh, not too long ago. It didn't appear that too many were coming out of uh, not yet. Uh, the current system, <laughs> yes. But uh, again, I'm uh, trying to approach this from a business standpoint and hopefully we can uh, act uh, prudently uh, before uh, we get into to big trouble uh, with this system. I uh, appreciate uh, both of your uh, testimonies. Uh, uh, Mr. Stair, uh, you indicated that the trend in the private sector is away from a defined benefits plan. Uh, could you elaborate it and do you think that we have a, a model that we should look to uh, in the federal system? Yes, there, there is uh, no question about it that 
uh, over the past uh, several years, the, the trend in the benefits uh, uh, design has been more towards defined contribution type plans. Um, and, and I certainly think that that's the wave of the future. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, there, are, there are tremendous complications associated with uh, operating a defined benefit plan. Uh, many of these complications disappear with defined contribution plans. Uh, there has been a whole change in the uh, contract or relationship between employer and employee. Uh, to the point where uh, employees are being held personally much more responsible for their own uh, uh, retirement uh, uh, needs in the sense that um, we have many uh, flexible benefit programs in place today which, which offer employees choices. Employees more and more are making those choices. And the employer is no longer the uh, you know, paternalistic uh, role there. It, it's more of a facilitator in, in bringing tools br to employees, bringing options to employees to let them make up their own minds and make their own choices about what they're, what they're going to do in their own retirement needs. So uh, I would say that definitely there's a trend here that's, that's not going to go away. I mean, this is, this is a definite shift in, uh, in benefits design in the, in the private sector. The other uh, common denominator I've heard in both of your testimonies is that uh, both COLAs and it seems like the accrual rate are also, have also driven up the uh, costs of, uh, uh, of this uh, operating this uh, retirement system. Is that correct, uh, COLAs and accrual rates? Uh, I, it's my understanding that, that it's almost all COLAs. That, I, mean, the, I mean, I pointed out in my remarks that I believe the accrual rates the 1.7 percent. Well, that, that has been adjusted. That is, right. even after it has been adjusted, is, it could still be viewed as a little high versus industry practices. But that isn't going to kill you. What's going to kill you is your COLA. Right. Uh, from my understanding, uh, almost half of the total liability of the plans, though I heard a figure of $1.7 trillion, almost half of that is due to the COLA. I'll tell you, th there is no need for 100% adjustment of CPI in anybody's pension check. There's been dozens of studies shown that people just simply don't need that much. You're not affected in retirement, in your retirement years, by all the things that are included in the consumer price index. There's simply no need for, for those uh, increases uh, to be made in the first place. It's a gift. I appreciate your comments, and I'll yield uh, now to the uh, gentleman and ranking member, Mr. Moran. Well, I think one of the pivotal issues here really is uh, uh, what would people at the level of members of Congress uh, with comparable responsibilities, skill, experience, educational level, be receiving in the private sector in terms of pay and comparable benefits. Uh, with regard to federal employees, I think we have the same question to ask, but there are other complicating factors. For example, we are trying to reduce the size of the federal workforce. And so we ought not enact policies that conflict with each other. For example, if we are now offering $25,000 buyouts to senior management personnel to reduce the size of the federal workforce by 272,900 people, our other actions should be consistent with those. Now, uh, let me ask uh, Ms. Kingsbury first, uh, is this proposal consistent with that objective or based in, upon your understanding of human resources within the federal government, which is your area of expertise, do you think uh, this is going to 
cause an unnatural reaction with regard to the number of retirements? Uh, for example, would they uh, try to retire under the old system immediately uh, so that you might negate the, the intent of, of the legislation? Uh, or do you think by raising the high, uh, the, the, the average pension uh, retirement benefit by using the high five instead of the high three, that this it might be inconsistent with the other objective downsizing government. Uh, let me ask for your comments as to the consistency of this legislation vis-a-vis -vis the other companion legislation on downsizing. Well, I think there are a substantial number of people in the federal government who are currently fully eligible to retire. And consistent with their behavior and in fact consistent with some public policies that suggest people should be encouraged to retire later, uh, many of them have in fact stayed on. If the, it, I don't know of any particular survey, the Senior Executives Association may have one, um, of the number of people who would retire if the rules of the game were, were significantly changed as some of these proposals would do. Uh, but I think it's probably a non-trivial number, and if the number of people who've been in and out of my own office in the last couple of days who knew I was coming up to, to uh, appear before this committee is any indication, there are a number who would change their plans fairly dramatically uh, if the rules of the game were changed. Um, so I think that that's an important issue. FERS was designed to be comparable to uh, some synthesis of private sector plans. And that principle, it seems to me, is still valid. It's a principle we supported uh, in the run-up to the creation of FERS, and I think it's a principle we would continue to support today. Uh, you touched on a particularly uh, sensitive area in uh, your introductory remark concerning the comparability of members of Congress to roles in the private sector, and that's something that we are frankly struggling to do. Um, while, as Mr. Stair said, there are some limits under ERISA to the contributions to thrift payment plans, those limits only apply for purposes of the tax de deductibility issues. And we are aware that a number of firms, particularly larger firms, have fairly significant programs for senior managers, profit sharing programs, uh, other kinds of, of uh, pension contribution programs largely out of the public domain because they don't have to be reported. And we are frankly struggling at the moment to get some information about that because insofar as it, it relates to members of Congress, I think that debate ought to play out at that level. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Kingsbury. I, I think that's terribly important to bear in mind if we're looking at comparability. We're, we're looking at <coughs> the compensation that is afforded someone based upon their experience, their education level, the, their skill level, whatever uh, achievement level they have uh, they've accomplished through their career. In the private sector, uh, profit sharing plans, stock options and so on, uh, are a very important aspect of compensation. Uh, and in fact, with senior executives, which is probably what a, the level that would be comparable to members of Congress, uh, the, uh, uh, you're talking about some very generous plans that are significantly higher oftentimes than the visible salary levels. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Stair, uh, again, uh, matching the members of Congress as to their relative level of, uh, of expertise, experience, responsibility. Uh, what do you think would be comparable compensation? Um, well, let's start with uh, the defined benefit plan. At DuPont, uh, senior management of the company participate in the same uh, pension plan that I do. And our accrual rate is 1.5 percent of pay uh, times service minus half of the primary Social Security benefit. That's your pension formula. 
now you have a defined, uh, oh, and when you collect that pension, uh, you can collect it as early as age 58 with no reduction. If you uh, collect it sooner than that, you'll uh, be looking at a reduction factors of 5% a year. Um, are you a senior executive, uh, Mr. Stan? I would consider myself to be middle management. Mm -hmm. well, do you mind my asking what your salary is since the topic of this issue is salaries? Uh, my salary is approximately uh, 95000 mm -hmm. And And uh, so your uh, total benefit package when you retire, you're what, in your 40s now? Thank uh, you very much. Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm 52. 52. So, uh, uh, in another 10 years, your what would you ex anticipate your total retirement benefits to be? Uh, well, we'll all have to put on our computers and make some projections here as to what we think might happen in the future. Um, but at at a 1.5% uh, accrual rate, let's just start there, with uh, let's say 40 years of service, that would give you a, uh, a factor of 60% of your pension, but then there's that offset of uh, Social Security benefits. So after the offset and everything, uh, you would probably be looking at something more like around 40% of pay of pre-retirement pay for coming from your uh, from your pension. So you'd and be getting about forty thousand dollars total benefit, no profit sharing, nothing on that. To well, supplement. I was about to say no no profit sharing, but in addition to that, we have a defined contribution plan similar to yours, except that I'm limited to putting in six percent of my pay in that plan, whereas you could put in ten percent in yours, and so I'll I'll have whatever that benefit will accumulate to by the time I retire and then when I do retire that that those funds could be uh, drawn down by me in, in yeah. several different but ways. But that's so. your your pay that comes directly out of your pay it's it's uh, is that after tax? It is, is uh, before tax. Yeah but and ours would be before tax too it's, it comes out of a, a that's salary. Correct. That's correct. Uh, and that's optional. Uh, right. And, uh, and now you say your middle manager, senior management is what, 150, 200,000 at DuPont? Well, the, I mean, we go all the way up to the chairman of the yeah. board, we're talking about a whole different kind of animal. Yeah. The uh, senior executives uh, are um, 200,000? 200, 250. 250. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, it is extremely difficult to make these comparisons, and, uh, and, and I, as I see that you're struggling to do this, I, I would do the same thing, but I would caution you a couple of things. One is the uh, amount of benefit that I'll receive when I retire won't be adjusted for full CPI. I expect to be retired quite a long time, and I would expect that most people would expect to be retired for quite a long time. If you start looking at what your benefit would be down the road, you're, you're in many cases looking at benefits that exceed pay levels when, when people retire. Full COLA adjustments really start to make more difference than anything else. You can start at a, I mean, I could start at a lower pension than you, but if I have 100% COLA adjustments to that every year versus somebody else who only has an adjustment of half the COLA once in a while, it won't be too many more years before I'll pass that other person and then I'll just keep going. Well, I appreciate uh, what you're saying, although the, Mr. Merther testified earlier that the congressional plan was deliberately designed to not to provide full COLAs. In fact, if the inflation rate is 2 percent this year, the congressional cost of living increment would be 1%. If it's 3%, it would be 2%. It'll probably fall somewhere between 2 and 3%. Uh, so that's significantly less than the cost of living. It's, it's either half or, or two-thirds. Um, 
the, uh, I know Mr. Mascara wants to ask some questions, so I don't want to take up too much time, Mr. Chairman. I, the, um, uh, again, I, I would only emphasize, make a point. I, I was going to make it of Mr. Chrysler that I'm not really sure that in trying to determine what is appropriate compensation for the members of Congress that where we should be focusing is the lowest common denominator of employees. I, I think this uh, economy and, and uh, our society really is based upon an incentive system and, and that uh, I agree with the comment that Mr. Mascara made that, that for people to be, a, for the kind of people that the American public wants to be in public office, particularly in the United States House of Representatives, it, it's, it seems to me it, it, uh, uh, it ought to be a very competitive position and there ought to be some comparable uh, incentive regardless of our uh, uh, tendency to, uh, uh, to um, uh, denigrate our profession and ourselves at, uh, uh, whenever the, the uh, public chooses to, uh, uh, to suggest that uh, it's appropriate. I, 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 I think that uh, the public has an insatiable appetite for uh, reducing uh, public officials' uh, compensation and anything else that is afforded them. Uh, if it were up to them, we would be giving them back, putting money in their pockets that uh, uh, with zero salary. So I, I don't, I don't think that uh, uh, we ought to be looking at some of the factors we've looked at as much as considering what is the uh, anticipated uh, uh, retirement security that that people. Uh, at, a, at a very competitive level in the private sector would be receiving. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman uh, for his comments and for your response, and I'd like to yield now to Mr. Mascara. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, apparently, uh, Ms. Kingsbury and Mr. Stair, you do not agree. I could see. About some things. Yes, and, 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 uh, and I was curious, uh, Mr. Stair, uh, who do you work for? The DuPont Company. DuPont Company, and, and you apparently uh, represent this uh, group. What is it? Financial Executives Institute. That's correct. And, and you've been invited here today to give some balance to the testimony that. Uh, well, I'm not sure about the it. balance part, but I uh, I was uh, more interested in providing uh, some perspective from the private sector. Well, that's fine, and and we welcome that. Uh, but I did detect early on that there was a difference of opinion between you and, and uh, Ms. Kingsbury. Uh, one is, uh, and specifically, uh, I noted that uh, Ms. Kingsbury indicated that one study showed that 97 percent of the people in the private sector made no contribution to their pension. And then she uh, noted that there was a second study uh, whereby 88 percent, was it? The first was 97 percent of the individual surveys. That was a Bureau of Labor Statistics okay. uh, study. Uh, the second one um, was a study of, of uh, benefit plans, and what the, the 88 percent applies to the benefit plans. Okay. Well, let me go on with the question, then. and we have heard several times that the federal government bears too great of a share of providing employee retirement benefits. These were questions. However. And here it is, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says that 95 percent of all private pension plans do not require employee contributions at all, the full cost of these private plans being borne by the employer. On the other hand, federal employees contribute a large share of their income to purchase retirement benefits. Last year, cash payments to the Civil Service Retirement Fund totaling nine and a half billion dollars were made by federal employees, the Postal Service and the District of Columbia. As a result, employees paid 26 percent of the cost of providing retirement benefits in fiscal year 1994. In other words, if the federal retirement system worked like most private plans, the federal government would have had to pay an additional nine and a half billion dollars last fiscal year. What is your reaction to this? Uh, you seem to be arguing that the federal program should 
run more like private plans. But if the federal plan were more like private plans, the government's contribution would have to increase, not decrease. Would it not? Well, you have to draw your baseline somewhere before you begin these, these arguments. Otherwise, you just wind up spending more money. Um, by, by that, I mean that there is a substantial body of thought, particularly amongst the uh, union uh, uh, representatives, that state that um, really the, the company's costs for pension benefits are deferred wages, that uh, employees have, over the years, decided to take less in pay and more in pension benefits, that they're trading them off between the two. So if you were to apply the same sort of logic and rationale to that, what, what I'd suggest is, you, to, to the federal system, what, what you'd wind up with is that uh, if, if there's a 0.8 percent uh, payroll contribution by uh, the employee into the, to the system, then, then uh, and, and you wanted to get rid of that, then that would mean that the employee's pay would go down by 0.8 percent so that the government would have the money to put in instead. So you see it's a zero-sum game. You can't keep adding to it. The other point is, and it's one which I, I, uh, I agree with, is that uh, it is unusual to find employee contributions for defined benefit plans. The, uh, the, the notions sort of really struggle and fight against each other. Uh, and I would, I would definitely recommend that, that uh, this is a, an area that you ought to in investigate for change. But I don't think that it also means that there's a 0.8 percent pay raise in, in the offing. I heard you uh, use the word several times, paternalistic. And uh, it appears to me that the private sector in this country, as well as this huge government, uh, is talking about uh, employees worrying about their own future, uh, that uh, the question of whether even, and I've heard someone question whether Social Security should continue, and that we should all go to some kind of thrift plan or 401k. And I recall the uh, recessions, many recessions, when transfer payments uh, were a blessing, that the country did not get down the chute because we had pension plans that were paying pension fund benefits as well as Social Security. Uh, is it your opinion, or do you have a feel for uh, where this country is going and where the private sector is going in regards to uh, pensions for their employees. Are you asking me, sir? Either. Well, you go ahead, Nancy. Yeah. Our our uh, preliminary examination of this so far is that I think it's correct to say that there is a shift toward uh, defined contribution plans, although. Uh, one recent study that we looked at said, uh, suggested that 63 percent of the plans in that study had both, had, had a FERS type uh, combination of defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans. So I, it's not clear to me that the shift is in the interest of uh, reducing paternalism so much as it is in the interest of increasing portability. I think there is a concern in this country and certainly there is in the federal government of, uh, in effect, trapping people in an employment situation because their benefits are tied solely to that entity as opposed to being something that they can uh, uh, pick up and take with them. And I think that's more the reason for this shift than uh, some notion that companies don't have an interest in sustaining uh, the financial future of their employees. I personally believe that, um, and I think this is supported by human resource uh, uh, professional studies, um, that if you look at it from a long-term perspective in terms of your capacity as an entity, be it government or private, to recruit and retain the quality of the workforce you need, some consideration of future pension uh, and, and retirement uh, living has to be a part of that mix. I think it has to be. Uh, what the exact right mix is remains to be seen. but. Um, people in this country are not given to saving for the long term very well, and I think we need to help facilitate that. Yeah, I just want to assure that it was not out of greed that the companies no longer want to be paternalistic, and I, that concludes my remarks. I thank uh, the gentleman uh, for his questions, and I want to take this opportunity to also thank our panelists uh, for 
their participation. Uh, this is a very sensitive uh, question uh, when you deal with employee and member uh, compensation and benefits and retirement. Uh, but uh, we, we thank both of you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Kingsbury, we have additional questions both from the majority and the, the minority uh, that we will submit to you and without objection they will be part of the record. Mr. Chairman, I have some for Mr. Steer as well as Ms. Kingsbury. Yes, so and we have uh, some questions then also for you, Mr. Steer, that we will also make a part of the record. I want to particularly thank Mr. Steer for uh, his participation coming from the private sector for giving us uh, the benefit of his uh, experience and knowledge of uh, retirement systems and uh, uh, we uh, uh, on the subcommittee do appreciate uh, your participation and your contrib uh, contribution and also your patience today. Today we've ha had an opportunity to hear from just about every member of Congress who requested an opportunity to be heard and as you can see there's a wide diversity of opinion. We're going to try to take uh, that information, digest it, uh, working with uh, both the majority and the minority and uh, all the members of this, this panel and do our best job. I think uh, I've expressed an interest in trying to be fair, trying to be equitable and uh, try to realize that we are dealing with real people and uh, real life situations and, uh, and their fortunes and, and their retirement and their family. So uh, with that in mind, I think it's been a, a good uh, hearing uh, today. I appreciate uh, the participation of the minority members and uh, ranking uh, member uh, and the whole panel uh, and again our witnesses and uh, with that uh, I'll, I declare this uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. See you, Chair. Later, a hearing on Mexico's financial condition. Witnesses at the Senate Banking Committee hearing include Federal Reserve Board Chairman Alan Greenspan and Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin. Mexico's financial condition and the U.S. aid package 